Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. What's going on guys, this is Rob. And as I was sitting here thinking about this, I was like, you know, I could do the Aliens comics, but the more I think about this, because I, I asked you guys a question previously, like what stories I hadn't finished that you guys wanted me to finish up. And people said Dark Side War. They were like, finish Dark Side War. Here's the thing, I made Dark Side War back when my video sucked. And so I was like, you know what? If we're gonna finish it, we might as well remaster it, right? So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna remaster Dark Side War. And I promise this one won't suck as much as the last one did. So here's the thing to understand about Dark Side War. Dark Side War was the event that led into DC Rebirth. And it was basically DC kind of, you know, pruning a lot of the things and adjusting a lot of the things and setting the stage for a lot of things. One of the other important concepts to understand here with Dark Side War is that some of the stuff that we see does not apply anymore. That a lot of this, not really a lot, but some of it was changed during the events of Dark Knight's Metal and Death Metal and Scott Snyder's Justice League run. So uh, I will go ahead and make sure that we know what information stays, what information goes as we're going through this story. But you know, when it comes to, to Dark Side War, we're initially going to start with issue number four. 40. Now this whole video is going to be issues 40 through 45. For those of you guys who want to keep track or buy it online or something like that, it's called Dark Side War Act 1. For issue number 40, there's not really a whole lot that matters here. I mean, we're kind of given a little bit of information, but it's things that, you know, things that we already know for the most part. For example, uh, Scott Free is the son of High Father on New Genesis. And for example, that like Metron brokered a peace between New Genesis and the planet Apocalypse where Dark Side resides, different things like that, you know, just, just that kind of situation. What does matter and really the, the big takeaway that came from issue number 40 from the the very beginnings of all this is the anti-monitor Mobius. Now, initially we didn't know the anti-monitor had a name. And in fact, we didn't even really know that he had any kind of personality or anything. All we really knew about the anti-monitor is what we got in the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths and Infinite Crisis, when the anti-monitor was responsible for the destruction of the multiverse. And then we returned during the events of Infinite Crisis and Sinestro Corps War when he joined the forces of Sinestro. But this was a huge change, a huge departure for his character, because one, it's established his name is Mobius, and two, he was the reason for the destruction of the Earth 3 universe. Now, as part of the lead up to the events of Dark Side War, you got a story called Forever Evil. And Forever Evil was basically this story where the crime syndicate of America, which was an alternate reality version of the Justice League, where all the heroes are bad guys, where they had basically fled their universe and showed up in the main DC universe. That was the whole basis behind the Forever Evil event. We didn't really know exactly why that happened. And when Dark Side War took place, when that started up, this gave us the explanation that in effect, uh, Mobius had shown up to the Earth-3 universe and basically eradicated all the life on that on that world and then in turn had absorbed all of his energies into himself. And so the big thing that kind of comes out of this and, and kind of what, what we're told here, when Metron encounters Mobius, and a really good way to view Metron is kind of like the DC Universe version of the Watcher to a degree. I mean, he's not as powerful as like the Watcher in Marvel and even in and of himself, he's not wildly capable. Uh, he is in so far as the fact that he's a new god. So like, you know, he's stronger than your average bear. But, uh, and, and you know, with the, the chair that he has, the, the Mobius chair, that's what makes him so capable is because the person who sits in the Mobius chair has all knowledge of everything that's currently going on in the universe and everything that has happened in the universe. And so one of the things that happens is that when Metron encounters and really comes across Mobius, he initially tells him like, you can't do this, right? Like, I know what it is that you're shooting for. I know what it is that you're trying to do. Do not do this because I know what fate awaits you. You're going to call down the power of Darkseid and Darkseid's going to lead to your destruction. Not only that, the war that you're trying to instigate here between yourself and Darkseid, this is going to lead to the end of the of, of the universe. It's going to lead to the end of reality. And one of the things that's kind of hit on here in Dark Side War is that because we got events like Crisis on Infinite Earths and Zero Hour, Crisis in Time and Infinite Crisis and Final Crisis and even the main New 52 event, because of the fact that we got so many different crises events that basically rewrote the universe, if another one were to happen, the, the universe and even the, the multiverse wouldn't be able to survive. It would all just basically be destroyed. There'd be no way to save it. Because one thing to understand is that in the previous crisis events, it was more or less restructuring reality is really what it was. It was like remodeling your home. What Metron's talking about here is that if another crisis were to happen, it'd be like blowing your home up, right? That's more or less what he's what he's offering here, what he's saying here. At the end of the day, though, Mobius doesn't care, right? He's looking to attain the power, uh, really a, a attain a way to kind of go back to the way he was before, to undo this hellish life that he's living. Now, we are given a bit of an explanation and really kind of a lot of an explanation in terms of why he is the way he is, uh, what it is that powers him and the, his, his whole motivation behind this war, but we don't find out until the end. So uh, it kind of sucks. <laughs> it kind of sucks in that way. But one of the things is that where Metron 
Sauron initially tries to stop him, ultimately he's overpowered by Mobius. And Mobius basically says like, I want a war with Darkseid. That's what I'm shooting for. And so the big thing that the other big thing that came out of this is that following Metron being overpowered, you end up having the appearance of this kind of mystery woman that seems to be operating, you know, along the lines of Mobius, helping him to achieve this goal. Now that's all basically prelude stuff. The meat and potatoes of this picks up when you have a woman who shows up in her apartment by the name of Marina Black. Uh, for those of you guys who are also wondering, this art is by a guy named Jason Fabok. It is amazing, isn't it? But Kanto is basically there along with Lashina waiting for this woman to get home. They ask her, are you Marina Black? And when she responds like, yeah, but like, where's my husband at? They kill her. Now this turns out that it's not the Marina Black they're hunting for. And they're actually looking for a very particular woman. It's almost like Terminator, right? You know, he's just looking for a very particular woman and it makes sense to just go through and kill every version they find until they ultimately kill the one they're looking for. Now, a little bit of explanation here. Uh, Lashina is part of a group called the Furies and Kanto is an assassin for Darkseid. Uh, the Furies are almost like Darkseid's kind of elite guard composed almost entirely of women. There are men who are Furies, but you don't really see them all that often. Uh, but Lashina is one of the best. She's not the absolute absolute best, but she's one of the best. But what this does is it switches over to a guy by the name of Scott Free. Now, Scott Free is also known as Mr. Miracle and kind of referencing our discussion on Metron brokering peace between Apocalypse and New Genesis because they kind of represent the idea of like absolute good and absolute evil, even though New Genesis kind of stretches the limits of credulity when it comes to truly being good. Uh, what this basically meant was that they had to switch sons, right? So uh, the son of Darkseid went, uh, went over to New Genesis and his name is Orion. The son of High Father, who was named Scott Free, was sent to Apocalypse. Now, unlike Orion, who lived on New Genesis, who lived a pretty great life and ultimately became a hero, Scott Free was basically thrown into the slave pits by, by Darkseid and just left there. The result is that he became a master at being able to pick all manner of locks. And so that's why he's called Mr. Miracle. He's kind of the escape artist of the DC universe because there's no lock in the universe that he cannot pick. But the thing here is that him kind of going around and bouncing around and, and sort of being free to a degree, he's ultimately hunting for what it is that Darkseid's trying to to achieve because word has reached his ears that dark side is shooting for a particular goal and so the result of this is that once he ends up grabbing one of the mother boxes and it kind of spills the beans on what dark side shooting for he begins to panic right he's kind of like okay like this can't be possible something has to be done right so a lot of mystery going on in this this first little tidbit here now from there we switch over to an investigation that's taking place with the justice league this is not overly important it kind of is to a degree because it sort of furthers the story a little bit but it's a little more character development than anything else this first part is really just kind of designed to to show us what the different people are doing at different points in time. Uh, but we do have Jessica Cruz here. And for those of you guys who are not familiar with Jessica Cruz, she was introduced as part of the Forever Evil event and then just sort of kept moving forward with DC Comics. And the idea is that her whole writing experience or the, the whole idea behind creating her character is that she's someone who's kind of riddled with anxiety and depression. And so in a lot of ways, it seemed to sort of mirror to a degree the struggle of Jeff Johns and even more so the struggle of Sam Humphreys, a writer who was who's amazing in everything he touches. But the the idea is that from the Earth 3 Syndicate, you had their version of the Green Lantern called Power Ring. Unlike Hal Jordan in the main DC universe, Power Ring was just a coward, uh, but the ring itself would constantly talk to him and influence him. Now, for those of you guys who follow the Green Lantern mythos, you guys know it was essentially Volthoom. If you don't know what that means, you can find out more about that in the Green Lantern playlist that we have. But in essence, the ring of Jessica Cruz is possessed by a malevolent entity is really all you need to know. But she was very much just kind of controlled by her anxiety to a degree, right? It dominated every facet of her life. Her her evolution as Power Ring in DC Comics was designed to show or really kind of represent the struggle of a person overcoming their anxiety, things like that, becoming a much stronger person and finding their inner strength, right? So that's why she's here. It's the reason why if you've never heard of her as a Green Lantern, it's because at the time this story was written, she was exceedingly new. But again, there's not a whole lot doing here in this, this early tidbit, right? Just a few things here and there, some, some you know, little indications of what people are doing and, and so on and so forth. The big thing about this is that when you have the Justice League conducting their investigation, that because Cyborg is a living computer and can tap into the various intelligence satellites and things like that, he begins to pick up on a pattern. And what he starts to realize is that there have been these various murders taking place across the United States, basically the murders of women named Marina Black. And so because of that, he realized somebody's tracking her down. They're looking for a very particular person. Who that person is, the Justice League doesn't know. But in the middle of all this, suddenly out of nowhere, hands just like emerge from the mouth of Barry Allen. And like this girl just pulls herself out, right? This mystery girl 
while working for Darkseid, just pulls herself out. Now, the reality is we know this girl is Grail, right? We we know that the nature of her character, kind of looking at this in hindsight, but suspension of disbelief. Let's imagine that we're five or six years ago in DC Comics and we don't know. The cool thing is that as soon as she emerges, she immediately overpowers the Justice League, like right off the bat, right? Batman, Cyborg, all these guys, they're all immediately overpowered by this girl. Even Shazam falls before the power of this girl. Now, she doesn't kill them all. She just overpowers them. The crazy thing is that, of course, Wonder Woman jumps into the fray and Wonder Woman, you know, this, this girl basically reveals that she's of Amazon blood. So she, in some form or fashion, hails from Themyscira, which is kind of a crazy thing. It's not uncommon. It's not the first time that we've seen some mystery woman out there in the DC universe who hails from Themyscira who we've never heard of before. DC's done that like two or three times before. Usually it's only confined to the Wonder Woman mythos. Sometimes it's the Justice League as a whole. But the important thing is that following that, while, while she basically incapacitates the entirety of the Justice League, we switch over to Superman and Lex Luthor. Now, Superman is currently attending with Lex because for the most part, Lex Luthor is currently a good guy. And the reason why is because of the events of Forever Evil. The following the Forever Evil story that Lex Luthor had kind of reworked himself and when the heroes were incapacitated during that event by the crime syndicate, Lex Luthor led a contingent of villains and kind of reformed them into becoming heroes in order to save the world. Following that, some of the villains went back to being villains. Most of them stayed heroes. That's why you have Captain Cold here, different things like that. But the reason why Superman and Lex Luthor are together here is because of the fact that there is a former villain or at least a villain at one time named Neutron who's currently lost his powers. Now that goes into the Mezo event. It's not overly important for our discussion here. The important thing is that Neutron has the ability to absorb like nuclear radiation to use it for his own ends. The good thing about this is that when you have the ability to do that, you can achieve all kinds of stuff, flight, super strength, different things like that. The downside is that when your body loses the power to process nuclear radiation, it turns into cancer. And so because of that, Neutron's basically dying. <laughs> now, of course, Superman pulls a little bit of reverse psychology, manages to, to kind of get Lex Luthor to sort of cure the cancer on his own. But in the middle of all that, uh, they're suddenly met by a, a communication from Diana saying like, we need your help, right? There's some girl who's literally wrecking us. And so when Lex Luthor dons his new outfit in order to, you know, travel with Superman to face off against Wonder Woman, Lex Luthor's sister pulls a gun on him and then basically shoots him and then uses a mother box and teleports both of them directly to Apocalypse. And so following that, they're kind of out of commission. And so with Grail single-handedly taking out or at least temporarily incapacitating the entirety of the Justice League, she in turn casts an inscription or an incantation on the ground, which is designed to summon Doomsday. She also in turn takes the ring of Jessica Cruz because it's possessed by Volthoom and uses the power within to basically create a portal from this universe into the Earth-3 universe that summons the Anti-Monitor. And so at the moment, what she's done here is she's basically brought Anti-Monitor to Earth, which is what the Anti-Monitor wanted. And then she basically sends out an SOS, a beacon that Darkseid will pick up on and then Darkseid will travel to. And so because of that, what you end up doing is you switch over to Scott Free. And where Scott Free was initially in Involved in a bit of a conflict between Kanto and Lashina when he ultimately tracked down one of the women named uh, Marina Black, of course, not the one they're hunting for. He used his mother box and then teleported them away along with himself. And then when he arrived at his destination, he met the real Marina Black, the one that everybody's currently hunting for. Now, Marina Black, as she's given to us, and, and as is explained here, she is in effect an Amazon. The idea behind this is that Marina Black basically states that at some point in the past, she was the assassin of Hippolyta, the mother of Wonder Woman, right? Just her own assassin. But the idea behind the Amazons as they were originally introduced and how they were supposed to function was protectors of the earth, right? That at some point they would kind of go out into the world and they would protect it. The Amazons under the direction of Hippolyta abandoned that mission. And instead they remained confined to Themyscira and just refused to leave. And so Marina saw that as a betrayal of what their original role was supposed to be. And so she ultimately ended up encountering Darkseid, slept with him, and then produced a daughter who we know as Grail. The idea behind this though was that she knew something like that was going to happen. Like she knew that at some point Darkseid was going to arrive here. And so the whole idea behind this Darkseid war taking place between, you know, Mobius and, and Darkseid and these guys is that she knew that Darkseid would eventually show up on Earth somewhere along the line and conquer it. And so in order to ensure that would never happen, she produced her daughter Grail, who in turn she drove to ally herself or at least raised her so that she would ally herself with Mobius and then in turn try to kill Darkseid or try to lead to Darkseid's death. And so Scott Free picks up on this and says, this is crazy, right? This is a a crazy thing you're talking about. Because in a war between somebody like Mobius and somebody like Darkseid, billions of people on the world are going to die. And the response of Marina is, you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs. Right now, of course, Scott Free immediately rejects this. Not because Scott Free is a tried and true hero. His, his morality is a little murky, depending on what circumstance we're talking about, what era of comics even that we're reading. But he ultimately shoots
shoots this down because in his mind, the ends do not justify the means. And so this of course leads to Marina Black realizing he's gonna rat her out, right? He's gonna try to find a way to defeat her. She in turn tries to kill him. He uses his mother box and he basically teleports out. Now switching back to Superman and Lex Luthor, there's a couple things that go on here. The first is that once they're here and they're on Apocalypse, Superman does what he can to tend to the wound of Lex Luthor from his gunshot from his sister. The other thing is that once they realize they're on Apocalypse, there's a huge takeaway from this, right? Now we'll find out what that is here in a second because while we're at Apocalypse, we switch over to Darkseid. And, and Darkseid is informed that one, Superman is here and that two, uh, his daughter has summoned his presence. And so for the most part, the idea of Darkseid is to focus on Mobius first. That's really the biggest threat and his biggest concern. With regards to Superman, he almost kind of lets on this thing that nobody else really seems to know where you have Steppenwolf who's kind of like, I mean, why don't we just like, why don't you just let me destroy Superman, right? Why don't I go out there and take care of him or the other guys go out there and take care of him. But the response of Darkseid is no. Superman is small beans at this point in time. I'm not worried about the Kryptonian here on Apocalypse. And so he basically says, tell the slaves who exist out there on Apocalypse that if they're able to kill, if one of them is able to kill Superman, they'll no longer have to work on Apocalypse. They'll be spared any future labor that they'll have to endure. Now, one thing to understand about the planet of Apocalypse is it is a place of suffering and torment. That's true. It's about as close as you get to hell in DC Comics without actually going to hell itself, which of course is actually ruled by Lucifer Morningstar. But there are people who dwell there. There are actual individuals. There's a society there, right? There's a society. You have different castes in that society. You have rebels who are working to fight against Darkseid. You don't really hear a lot about them. Uh, one, because you don't really have any comic books that focus exclusively on that. And two, the fact that DC doesn't really focus on them is designed to kind of point to the idea that Darkseid rules Apocalypse with an iron fist and no attempt by rebels is ever really going to lead to their success in toppling him, right? So it's almost like DC's kind of saying they're not important because they'll never succeed anyway, right? So it's just kind of designed to go towards the idea that Darkseid's just kind of this person who cannot be defeated by anybody on his own on his own turf, right? On his own planet. And so following that, you have the Justice League who jump in, you know, kind of jump back into the fray again against Grail. And then of course, Mobius basically makes his move, kind of quells the entire conflict and is like, we're done. Because when that happens, you have Metron who shows up here and Metron's just kind of like, this has to end, right? Kind of trying to broker the peace again and saying this has to end, this has to stop. There's no way this is going to work. Now, of course, he also kind of tells the Justice League, you cannot defeat Mobius here, right? There's no way for you to overcome the power he possesses. You're talking about a being capable of wiping out all life on entire worlds and like ending entire universes, right? You're just not on that level. And so he ultimately whisks them away to the Rock of Eternity, which as most of you guys probably know, is where the wizard Shazam resides, where Shazam, uh, Billy Batson, got his powers. And the reason why they're here is because the Rock of Eternity is a place that for the most part cannot really be detected by people like Darkseid or Mobius or something like that. It's like a black hole, right? Just you can't really get into it. You can't really get out of it unless you know the proper means. And so what you end up having is Wonder Woman using her lasso of truth on Metron and then saying, how do we end this, right? How do we stop this conflict? How do we come out on top? You know, is there any way for us to defeat the Anti-Monitor? And the only off, uh, the only option that Metron can answer is, you have to take the Mobius chair from me. It's the only way to do it. And so she does exactly that. With a lasso of truth wrapped around him, she yanks Metron off the Mobius chair. Now understand, it's not as though Metron and his Mobius chair are like attractive magnets, right? It's not like magnets that are attracted through polarization. Like it's just this super impossible thing to do. Not at all. It can be done quite easily uh, if you have the, the proper level of power. I mean, if you or I ran up on Metron and tried to take him off the Mobius chair, that's not going to happen, right? But the lasso of truth is one of these artifacts that transcends normal levels of power. And it just sort of allows her to ensnare almost anybody and force them to tell the truth. There are limits to it, but it has actually been used on the Spectre in DC Comics. Now, the, the idea of it being used on the Spectre is largely due to the fact that the Spectre is just so incredibly powerful. And, and even then, he's just kind of bonded to a human host. So despite the power that he has, it affects more of the human side than it does the godly side. But we still know that like it can affect wildly powerful people. But while she does that, ultimately, you have Batman who dons the Mobius chair. And this is where you come across Batman, the God of Knowledge. For those of you guys who are familiar with the concept, but don't really know where it originated from. And so right off the bat, Batman starts asking a few questions to verify the knowledge of the Mobius chair, right? Who killed my parents? Ping, yes, it's Joe Chill. Then he asked the question, what's the Joker's true name? Now, this is where the whole story of the three Jokers came from. Now, keep in mind, this story was written back in like 2015, something along those lines, 2014, 2015, 2016. So during that period, it was about four or five years until we got an actual answer from DC Comics. This right, this moment right here 
Joker is the one that intrigued everybody for so long. Like we need to know like what the name of the Joker is, you know, and then later on you actually end up learning that there's three Jokers that exist out there and trying to find the names of those three Jokers. But for its part, with Batman being on the Mobius chair, initially the Justice League tries to talk him down and says, hey, look, like this chair is a level of power that we haven't really messed with before. And yes, you're capable, Batman, but this is not something that you can just do on your own, right? I mean, because Batman puts off all the indication that he's becoming drunk with power, that he's almost being influenced by the Mobius chair. There's almost a kind of arrogance that comes with the power that he possesses. But ultimately, Batman shoots them all down and it's just like, no, like I'm not getting off the Mobius chair. This Mobius chair belongs to me, right? Like I am the only person who can really process all the knowledge that's available or even use the Mobius chair adequately. And so the result is that there's no way to get him off of that. Now, the Justice League kind of resigns and accepts this fact because there's much bigger things to worry about than whether or not Batman's going to get off the Mobius chair. And if Batman becomes a threat later on, then they'll in turn respond. And there is truth to the fact that there's much bigger threats going on because there are. When we switch back over to Superman and, and Lex Luthor, as they're there on the planet of Apocalypse, all these slaves just come pouring on them, right? And attacking them all as best they can. The problem with this is that Superman's X-ray vision is fuzzy. It's not really working the way that it's supposed to. And his initial thought is that there must be some kind of lead in the air that's designed to dilute his powers. Because as we know, lead is the only, only material that Superman cannot see through with his X-ray vision. And if there's lead in the air, then it would mean that his X-ray vision wouldn't be able to see clearly. Now, of course, Lex Luthor chimes in and says, no, like there's, you know, uh, there's cadmium and there's polonium and there's, you know, mercuric oxide, but there's very little lead in the atmosphere. And so it's kind of like, okay, before they have a chance to figure out what's going on, all these different slaves descend. Now, Lex Luthor and Superman are able to fight them off, but in the process, Superman is injured. And that's when Lex Luthor picks up on the fact it's not anything like lead in the atmosphere that keeps Superman from being able to see properly with his X-ray vision. There's no sunlight here. And because there's no sunlight, Superman's powers are draining. And that's the thing to understand about Superman's abilities. He really is a solar battery. And so as long as you keep that battery charged up, you're always going to be able to use it to its full capacity. The problem is that once you take that battery off that charger, and then you just use that battery's life up in its entirety, there's nothing left. The battery is going to be dead. And that's how that works. And it's like water in a cup that as Superman strays away, the further away he is, or the longer he's away from the yellow sun, the more he uses his powers, the more those powers begin to disappear, right? So if you were to just use his powers sparingly, he would still be pretty effective, but those powers are draining every time he uses them. And so you can assume he's at something like, you know, 50% power or something along those lines. But picking back up with the Justice League, once Scott Free meets back up with the team, and then in turn, all of them are teleported back to where Grail and Mobius are at, that's when the arrival of Darkseid comes. And the truth about this is that despite the Justice League's power, their desire to step in and, and bring this conflict to an end, there's really nothing they can do. There's absolutely nothing they can offer in this, this battle. All they can really do is like fight against the forces of Grail or the forces of, of, of you know, Mobius or something like that. But in terms of actually stopping Mobius and Darkseid, they're powerless here, right? And that was really their biggest fear was that while they're here in Seattle and while all this stuff is popping off, their biggest fear was that the battle would start to reach a tipping point where there was nothing they could do to stop it. And so while you have Mobius and Darkseid facing off against each other on Apocalypse, you have Lex Luthor doing this final gambit where he looks at Superman and says, okay, you are powered by solar energy. These solar pits here in Apocalypse, they're solar fire, right? So I'm just going to throw you in. It's the only thing that I can think of. So he literally grabs Superman, throws him in the pits of the of Apocalypse, hoping that it'll basically recharge his energies and bring him back up. The problem with this is that when it does, he comes out completely corrupted and twisted because the fire pits of Apocalypse have corrupting energy. They're designed to twist you out and to mess you up and to cause all kinds of problems. They basically turn you into your most evil self. And so kind of transitioning for a second, this is when we get the origin more or less of Mobius, right? And this is where things are completely, were completely changed recently with Scott Snyder's run on Dark Knight's Metal, Death Metal, his Justice League run, all that kind of stuff. So the, the original origin or the actual origin of Mobius as it's given to us in this particular story is that Mobius was at one point in time, a science guy, right? He was an explorer. He simply wanted to understand the universe and how all those different things work. And so he designed the Mobius chair to be this device that could basically catalog all the information he'd gained as he gained it because the, the mind was simply just un incapable of handling all that information. The result of this was that during his explorations, he ended up encountering the anti-life equation that if 
free will exists in the main DC universe, which is the ability for you to choose your own path in life, to make your own decisions, the right ones, the wrong ones, all that kind of stuff. In the antimatter universe, because it's the opposite of the main DC universe, it has to be the opposite thing. And so the opposite of free will is anti-life, the ability to have your will dominated by others. And so with Mobius discovering the anti-life, he was basically bonded to the anti-life equation and lived his life as essentially a destroyer. The idea was that Grail approached him and effectively told him, if you kill Darkseid, you can free yourself of the anti-life equation and go back to being the person that you were before. Now, of course, again, this has all been changed. That what Scott Snyder and all those guys did is basically established that in the beginning, there was simply Perpetua, the creator of the multiverse. And she was the one who created the anti-monitor and the monitor and the forger of worlds and all that kind of new origin, right? So the new origin as is told by Snyder is the current origin for the anti-monitor. Now, how you wrap those two things together, how you can bridge that gap is really up to you, right? It's really your own way of doing this if, if you even choose to at all. It's entirely possible you can just ignore that, right? Because what Snyder did was basically come back and render the entirety of Dark Side War as a thing that doesn't really matter anymore, right? It's not really relevant. None of the none of the origin stuff that was given here is important anymore. But the, the big takeaway from this is kind of jumping back to the battle between the Anti-Monitor and, uh, and Dark Side because the Anti-Monitor is the living embodiment of the anti-life equation. When Dark Side commits his most desperate act in summoning the Black Racer, which is an aspect of death, and those the Black Racer touch basically end up dying, being taken to the afterlife, that when he summons it in, the Anti-Monitor, Mobius, uses his power of the anti-life equation to dominate the will of the Black Racer, and then in turn, bonds it to the Flash Barry Allen, turning Barry Allen into the Black Racer. And so the Black Racer runs headlong into Darkseid at the direction of Mobius, and then kills Darkseid. And Darkseid effectively dies, right? It's kaput. It's the end of the road for him. But like, this is where we picked up. This is where we really ended last time. I think we did the tie-ins. I'm not entirely sure. If we didn't, let me know. Um, But I think we did all the tie-in events because following this, things pop off, right? Things go nuts because now nobody knows what to do with Darkseid being dead. And in fact, the gods that give like Shazam his powers, for example, are all panicking. They're all bailing on him. Right? Like they're all basically bailing out. It's nuts, right? Superman is like a twisted, corrupted version of himself. No one knows what to do next. There's nobody leading apocalypse. Like it's probably the worst case scenario for almost anybody in the universe. Okay, so picking up with Dark Side War Act 2, which we never did here on Comics Explained, we are currently joining with the aftermath of Dark Side dying. And this is where people are kind of panicking and people don't really know what to do, right? I mean, Dark Side kind of represented this immutable, indestructible force that existed out there in the multiverse. And when his with his death, which was thought to be impossible, people are just kind of shocked by it. And so the first person to really express the, the concern over what's happened is the Black Racer, is the Flash. And it's one of these things where you would expect the response of Barry Allen to be, somebody get this off of me, right? Somebody get this thing off of me. I don't want to be bonded to it. I want to be away from this. You know, I value life. I don't want to be bonded to a being that literally embodies death. But instead, you know, you kind of have this response by Mr. Miracle and saying that like once, you know, the aspect of death is bonded to a host, it cannot be undone until death leaves that host or that physical host dies or something along those lines. And the response of Barry is, no, you don't understand. I want to control this, right? I don't want to, I don't want to get rid of it. I want to control this, right? So he is more or less being corrupted by this death entity that's taken over him. From there, you switch over to, to Superman and Lex Luthor. And again, Superman's corrupted by the fact that he was thrown in these solar pits. And it brings out every bit of, of anger and, and wrath that he has. Not in the sense that he's driven to kill Lex Luthor, but in the sense that he kind of seizes him and says, okay, so like, here's what's going to happen, right? Like, I know you want me to get you out of this place. You're not going anywhere, right? You're staying here. Because despite the efforts of Lex Luthor to prove himself as being a good guy, Superman still, still views him to be a bad guy. He still views him as being a villain, that he's simply just biding his time until he commits some campaign that's designed to allow him to, you know, conquer Metropolis or, you know, kill Superman or, or something along those lines. Now, the reality is that we, as the reader, know Lex Luthor legitimately is trying to be a good guy. Like he legitimately is trying to turn over a new leaf. And the funny thing is that this lack of trust is not a one-off from Dark Side War. In fact, when you pick up with DC Rebirth and you get into Dan Jurgens, the adventures of, uh, what is it? Superman and Lois Lane or whatever it was called. The one where you kind of had like the pre-crisis Superman kind of hanging out with the New 52 Superman and the, the New 52 universe. Then even then he doesn't trust Lex Luthor, right? Even then he sees him as, you know, a guy who will always be a bad guy. So it's, it's kind of interesting to see this reformation of Lex Luthor, but nobody believes 
believing in him because it's one of these things where you kind of feel bad for his character. It's like, damn, like Lex Luthor's really trying to be a good guy and Superman still won't give him any slack. But then you remember all the stuff Lex Luthor's done. And then you're kind of like, okay, so like Superman has a legitimate reason to be skeptical of this guy. Like Lex Luthor's always kind of been a dick. <laughs> but ultimately Superman just leaves him there, right? He just kind of knocks him, knocks him to the side and leaves him there and kind of gives him this ultimatum. If you come back to earth, I will tear you apart, right? I will, I'll kill you. I'll crush you just like I did with your armor. And so from there, you switch over to Batman and to, to Hal Jordan. And this is where things kind of got a little murky with Bruce Wayne. That Hal Jordan, you know, where, where Batman's like, Dark Side's dead, the war's over, it's time to go home. The response of Hal is, what about the anti-monitor, right? And the response of Batman is, he touched the anti-life equation, right? That turned him into the monster that he is. Now he's ejecting it from his body. And so when that's done, he's going to go back to being who he was before. Let's just split, right? Let's go our own way. And Batman actually intends to take the Mobius chair back to Gotham and then use it as a means to fight crime in Gotham. Now, here's the problem with that, right? Here's the biggest issue with that is it kind of stretches the limits of what Batman believes as a superhero, right? Whether you agree with him or disagree with him, the idea behind Batman is it'd be, it'd be great to say one step ahead of what people intend to do. But the, the problem with Batman with this Mobius chair is most likely it would corrupt him and push him to the point that he would start getting involved in pre-crime. Given your habits, given my intellect, I can deduce what crime or what you're most likely going to do next. So I'm suddenly going to arrest you before that happens. Now, I am not necessarily opposed to that, not necessarily in the sense of like arresting people before they commit crimes, but simply just having the Mobius chair and sitting down and saying, what have I been doing all this time? Why have I been letting superheroes go or le letting supervillains go free? I should just arrest these guys and throw them in jail. But you can't really arrest a person for a crime they haven't committed yet. And so because of that, it would probably push Batman to the point that he might become a bit of a dictator. And depending on how he does it, I may or may not agree with it. The way it's being depicted here would most likely be a circumstance that I wouldn't necessarily agree with. And even how Jordan is just kind of like, you know, that's kind of a crazy thing, but Batman ultimately sends him on his path and says like, you have to go do your own thing, right? You have to go to Oa because the forces of the parademons are descending on Oa. It's the single most powerful place in the entirety of the universe. And the parademons have no leader anymore. There's no dark side and they are inherently drawn to power. So it's one of these things where it's like, go and do your own thing. Now that of course leads into the Hal Jordan uh, dark side war one shot, right? So the same thing with Barry Allen figuring himself out about the flash, uh, you know, the, the, the black racer and so on that leads into the Barry Allen into the flash one shot. And so from there, you pick back up with Lex Luthor, who's basically discovered by Adora and she's a leader of the forgotten people. Now, here's the thing about this. Um, I'm not aware that Adora had ever been featured in the new 52 or even really anything like post crisis. Um, the only Adora that I really know of is like the old school character who was like smitten for Lex Luthor basically, but she was somebody who existed back in like the sixties and seventies. Right. And she was published back then. So I'm not aware that there's like any new version of Adora floating around out there. And even Jeff John seems to be kind of hand wavy about it in terms of how it's written. You know, he's like, well, who, you know, Lex Luthor's like, who are you? And she's like, if you knew, if you knew of us, then you know how, how impressive we are. Right. So it's kind of like, eh, there are people who exist and that's basically it, right? That's really the only explanation that we get. And in fact, the idea behind the forgotten people seems to be that they're just one of the tribes that exist out there on apocalypse that have somehow managed to escape the rule of, of, of dark side, or they just kind of biding their time until dark side's death. And the, the latter seems to be the case because she talks about a blind prophet who basically writes that the night that dark side dies that a human will appear on apocalypse and that human would change everything right it'd be the greatest hero from the world that they hail from from a place called metropolis they would have saved this world multiple times they would be an orphan they would be humbled by by being the child of farmers they would seek truth and embodiment of justice she's describing superman is basically what she's describing granted he's not really human but the fact that he desires to be one of them and they adopt him into their ranks he might as well be the other thing about this though and that's what's kind of ironic is it could also be Lex Luthor. Granted, he's not really the son of a farmer, but everything else that he's aspiring to, he's aspiring to become what Superman is. Whether he wants to admit it or not, that's what he's shooting for. And so when she asked the question, are you this man? His response is, yes, I am. Now, the indication here is he's kind of doing it in a duplicitous way where it's like, uh, yeah, yeah, of course I'm the guy you're looking for. Definitely. Uh, what do you need me to do? You know, that, that kind of a thing, you know, that kind of a, uh, you know, villainous sort of thing that he's doing. <laughs> but of course the, the people around him, bow to him, but Adora does not. And she's like, he hasn't earned that right yet. And so following that, you pick pick back up with Billy Batson, who has this kind of crisis. Now this goes into the Shazam God of God storyline, and it actually left a lot hanging, right? In the sense that there's this kind of discussion going on among these gods that power Shazam. Some of them say,
saying like this boy will not be my power you know some of them saying like he'll be my vessel so the, the gods are kind of fighting amongst each other now this goes into the old gods abandoning shazam and the new gods taking his place right but the, the one of the big issues and we can we can remaster the one shot if you guys want me to one of the big issues that we ran into with this is that there was a lot left hanging in the sense of what happened to these various beings who possess shazam right because after this you don't see shazam in dc rebirth right you don't see him until we got the newer issue that we did where superboy prime came back that's all you get we don't get anything between now and then he's just nowhere to be seen we have no idea whatever happened to the to the guys that empowered him or anything like that and dc never really bothered to explain it a lot of it was because it seemed to be that their main focus was let's just rebirth everything right let's just like fix this whole new 52 initiative let's make it what it's supposed to be and that was the main focus everything else kind of fell to the wayside what you guys saw with shazam between like the the end of new 52 going into DC Rebirth and everything they came after, DC's done that multiple times. That was the struggle of Power Girl post-Crisis, after Crisis on Infinite Earths, Hawkman, like all that kind of stuff. It's happened multiple times, right? Stuff just slipped through the cracks, which I think is really more a reflection of, of a lack of organization than anything else. But while Shazam essentially takes off, all you really have left are like Cyborg and you've got like Jessica Cruz, you know, and like that's it. You only really have, and you have Wonder Woman, you got like a couple people here. And of course, this leads to the remnants of the forces of Darkseid, seizing onto them and kind of initiating a great big huge fight. Now, the, the cool thing to come out of this is that picking back up with Lex Luthor, he's taken by the Forgotten People and, and basically brought to this place as kind of a, a great big huge power harvester. And the reason why is that when Darkseid died, his Omega Sanction, the source of all of his power, left his body and came arriving back to, to the planet of Apocalypse. And the reason why seemed to be a kind of failsafe, that when this happens, that it'll stay there until it's bonded to a new host, whether it's Darkseid or somebody else. And so when the Omega effect comes back because Lex Luthor is hooked up to this whole system, it'll bond to him. And if he truly is the person that the blind prophet's prophecy foretold, then it'll bond to him successfully. And Lex Luthor will in effect become the new dark side. And so what you end up doing is switching back over to the, uh, back over to earth with Grail and with uh, Mariana Black. And while the two of them are talking, we end up learning that the, the anti-monitor or Mobius has put himself in a kind of cocoon, that he's wrapped himself in this cocoon for the purpose of, of getting himself cleared up right of allowing him to purge himself of the anti-life equation and so where the bonding process with lex luther is successful and lex luther does become what is in effect the new dark side the fight between the forces of wonder woman and cyborg and mr miracle and the justice league that's left and the forces of of like steppenwolf and and those guys ends up coming into full fray when you have them all just sort of battling each other and so when the forces of wonder woman battle basically the forces of of kanto and all those guys you know the remnants of apocalypse's elite fight force the the battle sort of you know interrupted to a degree by the arrival of big barda now the reality is that big barda and scott free are in effect on a honeymoon <laughs> <laughs> following their marriage. But no one's supposed to know that they got married, right? Because Granny Goodness, the leader of the Furies, if she found out, she would come hunting for, for Big Barda and Scott Free and try to kill them both. And they would never relent. That's the thing to understand. They would never relent. Like they would never ever back off or anything like that. They would always come after them. Even if they were defeated, they would go back, they would regroup and they would come back again. And so Scott Free and Big Barda would spend their entire lives essentially looking over their shoulders. And so where she comes in, Big Barda immediately kills Kanto and then in turn, she turns to the rest of the forces that she kind of tells them, look, like, back off, right? You stay away, we stay away. Dark side's dead. There's nobody giving you direction or instruction anymore. You're not being lorded over by any kind of, of multiversal god, demon, entity, whatever, or anything like that. Just go let us live in peace. And the response of Lashina and all them is, no, we are not going to. You chose to forego the, the, the Black Oath of the Furies. You betrayed us, and we will never forget that betrayal. We will always come for you. You. We will always come back and get you. And so following that, you kind of jump back to Grail and Mariana Black. And the whole discussion between the uh, between the two of them is the idea of the anti-monitor purging himself of the anti-life equation, of Mobius reverting back to his previous form. And that's when you see this discussion that goes on where she kind of reveals that was the whole intention behind it all. That while she's talking, of course, Superman arrives back on the scene and immediately goes to attack Steve Trevor, right? Because it's kind of like, you know, to a degree, you're, you're, you're squeezing in on my girl, right? Because Superman and Wonder Woman were a thing at one point 
point in time, but he kind of shows back up on the scene. And so while all that's going on, Shazam's basically gone out doing his own thing. Flash is having this existential crisis in relation to the Black Racer. The Justice League is just kind of all over the place, right? Either they're incapacitated, they're hanging on by a string, or they're out basically out and about having nothing to do except deal with their own personal crises. That with the, with the Anti-Monitor finally purging the anti-life equation from himself, Grail takes it, right? And that's when we realize this was all based on the idea of her achieving the anti-life equation. That's what she was shooting for. This whole war was initiated by her. Even her mom's campaign was seeing the death of Darkseid was kind of modified and deviated by Grail herself. She instigated this entire conflict so she could seize the anti-life equation for herself. And the reason why the, the whole motivation behind this is she felt like death was too good for Darkseid, that she intended to basically bond, or at least does intend to find a way to resurrect Darkseid and then bond the anti-life equation to him and then in turn subjugate Darkseid. Okay, so I was supposed to record this earlier, but I got sidetracked watching the Megalodon Shark movie with Jason Statham. I love that movie. <laughs> <laughs> that movie is amazing. So we are picking up with the, the Batman one shot. And I want to test the waters here with the exception of like Shazam and Green Lantern to a degree because it's referenced, not all the one shots are important, but they are optional. They're just kind of here for us to cover right now. By the time this video goes live, I will already be out of town for uh, Valentine's Day. So I won't really know whether or not you guys care about these tie-ins until I get back from, from Valentine's Day weekend. Myself and Mariah are going out to get some food and we're going to go hang out at Great Wolf Lodge in Cincinnati. We're gonna have an amazing time. So uh, this picks up kind of with Batman racing off to Gotham to do his own thing. And the fact is he's actually kind of been here for a little while. He's been here for a few Few days and initially he meets up with commissioner gordon now for those of you guys who are going to be reading dc comics or who choose to jump into dc comics uh because of this video or, or any of the other dark side war videos that i've done and this took place during a branding initiative called dcu where there really was no continuity it wasn't like you read batman comics you read dark side war you read superman and it all kind of fits into a time frame so like you read one comic and then another and then another instead it was just kind of read whatever you want and so the result is that if you go and you read the actual Batman solo series at the time, Commissioner Gordon's Batman. But when you read this, Commissioner Gordon is just Commissioner Gordon. It was really frustrating for a lot of us who were continuity hounds. It was really sort of driving us insane. But for the average person, I think it was moderately successful. All in all, they ended up canceling it because I think most everybody hated it. But the important thing here is that Commissioner Gordon is getting kind of pissy. And the reason why is because what Batman's been doing in the city of Gotham is he's basically just been leading to a series of events whereby criminals who were handed over to the police department have to be released. And the reason why is because of what we talked about in the Dark Side War video, where Batman is basically processing pre-crime, right? Which is to say, Batman is looking at what people's intentions are using the Mobius chair, and then essentially snatching them up and handing them over to the cops before they actually do anything. The reality is that the justice system cannot arrest you for something that it thinks you might do if there's no tangible evidence to link you to that particular action, right? So, I mean, you could have all kinds of stuff in your car and there's no real way for them to link you to the crime. Now, there are laws that kind of deal with that. For example, like if you're in possession of any kind of drug paraphernalia and you've got it wrapped up. So say, for example, you have like a pound of weed and then you've got it packaged in like one ounce baggies just for yourself. They can arrest you for possession with intent to distribute, right? Because you could potentially distribute it. It's kind of a nonsense law and there's no reason weed should be illegal in the first place, but that's just kind of the nature of how some of those laws work. But for Batman's case, he's handing people over who he's used the Mobius chair to determine are going to be doing things like robbing people, uh, murdering other people, things like that. But because the nature of laws is that they're designed to be reactionary, which is to say, we stop you or we, we arrest you after you've done a thing, as opposed to uh, being something that happens before you do a thing, there's nothing that the Justice Department can really do, right? There's nothing that like, you know, that the police can actually do here. So they just got to let all these guys go. And it's kind of irritating uh, Commissioner Gordon to a degree, but more so than that, it's Batman. Because ever since Batman got on the Mobius chair, he's become very kind of, you know, ha ha, I know everything. And to a degree, he was always kind of that way. He was always kind of like, you know, if you can keep up with me, then it's just, you know, thank God for small favors. You know, it was always that kind of thing, but he was never really one of those where he just seems so disconnected from everything going on, right? And that's really how he seems in the Mobius chair. He just seems so incredibly disconnected
connected. And he almost kind of talks about the chair as if it's a thing that he has to have. And he even refers to people as the sense that like, there's just a baseline nature to all human beings that cannot be altered, base instincts. There are people out there that have a base instinct to kill, a base instinct to rob, that kind of a thing. It's almost Batman to the small degree that he did favor the possibility of people being redeemed has even, even really just lost that. It's just kind of like people do bad things and I'm just catching them before they do. It's a very cynical perspective. But here's the funny thing about this. The way that Batman handles a lot of these situations are actually awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so here's one instance, right? There's these guys who are going to be heading to this place called the Alpha Club. And they're, well, they intend, they intend to rob the place. Ultimately, they got a whole bunch of guns. So, you know, most likely somebody was going to get shot. But Batman basically uses the Mobius chair and then teleports them to the southern tip of the Arctic Circle. And is like, you're about 50 miles away from a research station here. Uh, just be aware, you are surrounded by mountains. Not the biggest deal. Doesn't usually get down to negative 40, but it is currently negative two. So uh, if you start burning the different things in your car, using the gunpowder and your your, your bullets, then you can probably keep yourself warm. There's a ship that's on its way here uh, because it's just kind of making its way through the ice. They don't know you're here, but you know, you guys will stumble upon each other and, and maybe they'll find a way to, to save you. But uh, while you're while you're waiting on them to arrive, praying to God that you actually live, you can think about your actions and just leaves. <laughs> <laughs> just leaves. He's just like, bye. And then just, you know, okay, bye-bye. And then just, just takes off. And that's, <laughs> he just leaves him there. Following that, he goes to another place where there's a guy named Mr. Phillips, but he actually breaks into his ex-wife's apartment with a knife in hand, essentially drunk. And the whole thing is that he's pissed off because after everything he had done, his wife had basically left him and divorced him. Uh, the reality is that he was beating her. And so it's not as though she left him because he was down on his luck, because he was running into some problems in the job. And she's like, you're no measure of a man at all, you know, and then just took off to to, to find greener pastures, it's because he was beaten on her, right? So Batman ends up snatching this guy up and then takes him to Themyscira. Now, initially, the, the, the women on Themyscira, the Amazons are just like, you're not supposed to be here. You can't just come here whenever you want. You can't just walk into this place. And they're like, who, who is this guy? And he's like, well, this guy's name is Mr. Phillips and he likes to beat his women. And he intended to murder his ex-wife with, with the knife that he has in his hand before I intervened. Uh, and so I have no intention of leaving him here, but I felt like spending a little while here will help change his view on women and they're like yeah yeah it will <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the Themyscira's are going to help him come to understand his place in the bigger picture. But that's kind of what happens here. Now, Batman, in turn, makes things personal, right? He makes things very, very personal here. And what he does is he goes to Crime Alley. And notice this, being the god of knowledge, having all this, this knowledge at his fingertips, knowing everything that's going on across the universe, Batman could deal with all the universe's problems. Instead, he really just kind of reduces down to dealing with his own because he's exactly what we've always said he was. He's a sad little boy crying because his mommy and daddy got shot. Now, it doesn't make him any less of a person because of that. That's just the core nature of Batman, their deaths at the hands of Joe Chill. And so what he does is he actually teleports directly to where Joe Chill's at and Gotham State Penitentiary. Now, Joe Chill is not really serving a life sentence. He was serving a sentence, but he always keeps getting shot down by the parole board. So he is more or less serving a life sentence and he always will because he essentially murdered people who are rich and powerful. And as we know, it usually carries a heavier sentence when you when you murder those individuals who have money and are influential. And so the result of this is that the the conversation Bruce has with Joe Chill is one of wrath and vengeance, right? And that, that's that's how we kind of know the Mobius chair is corrupting him. Because when you look at Batman, whenever he's dealing with situations like this, especially when he's usually dealing with criminals, the element of using fear is only done in so far as to throw them off guard or to use it as a, as a way to kind of terrify them out of their actions or something along those lines, right? It's designed to be something that, that sort of messes with people's heads, right? It's mind games, shadow games, that kind of thing. He never really uses fear for the actual purpose of just just terrorizing a person, right? Just personal vengeance. He never really uses it for that way, but that's what he's doing with Joe Chill. He's absolutely terrorizing this guy. Now, some could say, and, and you really could argue, he's got a right to do this, but the crazy thing is, is that he actually teleports him directly to uh, to Crime Alley, to the point to the, the place where the crime was committed, and Joe Chill almost kind of gets excited about what was going on. He's like, yeah, man, you know, I, I killed Gotham's movers and shakers, and that's why I keep serving a life sentence, you know? I, you know, I, I put a bullet in these two super rich people. And he's like, in that moment, I was the most powerful I ever was. I had the power of life and death. I decide who lives and who dies. You know, and then he starts talking about Bruce Wayne. He's like, you know, I bet that little kid, he had nightmares and everything. You know, he was, I was that little kid's boogeyman, right? This whole idea that he felt like God, right? He felt like God insofar as he could snuff out the lives of others or determine or, or decide that they could live and then became like this specter that just haunted the life of the eight-year-old boy who survived. And one of the things that he talks about here is that when, when Batman says like, you know, give me a number, like I know the Waynes weren't the first ones. I know they weren't the only 
only ones that, that you killed. Give me a number. He says 40, that he's killed 40 people because of the fact that it made him feel more empowered. Now he did this at the request of others. He did it of his own volition, but regardless, it satisfied a personal desire for him. And that's the crazy thing is because when Bruce reduces it down and says, I'm not really here for the 38 other people that you killed. I don't really care about them. I care about the two people you cured, killed here that night in Crime Alley. The response to Joe Chill is why? Like, why do you care about the two people that I killed here in Crime Alley? Why would Batman be concerned about that? And that's when Bruce reveals his identity and says, because I'm Bruce Wayne, right? Like, and that immediately scares the hell out of Joe Chill, right? Absolutely scares the heck out of him because he's like, I'm all grown up, right? The first words that you have when you, when you come back to this place is you wish you would kill the little kid who was there so that nobody would have been able to trace you to the crime and you would have gotten away scot-free. That's the first thing you do. But like, I'm your boogeyman now. You have to accept the fact that now you're the one who created the Batman. I'm here because of you. I'm here because you killed my parents. And so I can make your life a nightmare in this place, Joe Chill. I can let word reach the ears of all the prisoners around here who were here because of Batman that you're the reason he exists. If everybody here finds out you're the one who created Batman by committing a murder in Crime Alley, they're all going to come for you. They can't get to me, Batman, but they can get to you, right? So if they can't kill me, they'll do the next best thing and they'll make your life a living hell in every conceivable way and in some ways that you can't even imagine. So I just want you to know, right? That's, that's literally the whole thing. He wants Joe Chill to know the fact that Joe Chill created Batman. Joe Chill is the reason that Batman exists. It's all about just intimidation and it's all it's all about just terrorizing this guy. And of course, he also goes on to say like, you will never tell anybody who I am. You will never give anybody my identity. If you will, I will make sure that you die in this place. And that's really what would happen. Like Batman, if Batman told people that Joe Chill created Batman, they would kill Joe Chill. And so in a roundabout way, maybe not so many, not in so many words, Batman's like, I will have you killed in this place. That's basically what he's saying. Now, of course, once he gets back directly to uh, to the, the Batcave and you have Alfred there waiting on, you know, with drinks and that kind of a thing and dinner to kind of help him get together, Batman start, is basically bleeding from the ears and the nose and the mouth. And the reason why is because the chair is one of these things where it doesn't necessarily have a mind of its own, but processing all that information kind of creates a bond or a link between the person and the chair. And so if you start using the Mobius chair for the for means that it wasn't meant to be used for, personal gratification, different things like that, essentially defying the will of the chair, then it'll in turn cause problems. Now, the other thing that's kind of hit at here is that there almost seems to be a parasitic relationship here in the sense that if it was symbiotic, Batman gains something, the chair gains something, and then they just both kind of go forward. But Batman's struggling the way that he is, bleeding the way that he is. He goes as far as to say that he's sustained by the chair, right? The chair feeds, it basically keeps him uh, nourished. He doesn't have any need for food or water or anything along those lines, that it does satisfy a need of the chair in that way, but it's taking a toll on Bruce Wayne. It's killing it in effect, right? Because while Bruce Wayne may very well be sustained, the chair itself almost seems to be sucking the life out of him. And that's that seems to be one of the reasons why only new gods, only somebody like Metron or a person like that, who has, who, who is by all standards of measurement, uh, immortal in comparison to whatever means of destruction are available out there, right? He's not truly indestructible. He can be killed, but it's very, very difficult to do. But because you have to have a kind of physiology to be able to withstand the rigors of the chair, that it wasn't really meant for mortal men. And so because of that, it's taking the toll on Batman. Now, Alfred really kind of asked him like, why don't you just leave the chair? The response of Bruce is, well, I can leave it anytime I want to. Notice this, it's almost like a drug or like an addiction of some kind, right? Bruce believes he has to have the chair. He needs the chair. And so there's almost kind of a mental link in that way. He talks like an addict. Well, I can quit anytime I want. I can quit drugs anytime I want. I can stop drinking anytime I want. I can quit gambling anytime I want. I got 10 to one odds. I can stop tomorrow. You know, it's that kind of a thing. But ultimately he just doesn't acquiesce. He just stays on the chair. Now there almost seems to be a kind of physical link in the sense of Batman cannot actually get up. The chair's keeping him there, but we don't really get enough information to know whether or not that's the case. It just kind of seems to be. He tries to stand up and he can't really do it. Almost as if he he is attempting to get himself out of the chair, but doesn't actually want to leave, right? Maybe, you know, not faking it or anything like that, but it's just a desire to stay in the chair and to maintain all that information. And so ultimately he says like, me being in this chair is really what's best for Gotham. Me having this at my disposal, this is the best thing for us because now I can do a better job of one, keeping Gotham under control, but two, I can focus on the one thing that has plagued me ever since I became Batman. The one guy that I've never been able to figure out, the person whose entire existence is as much an enigma to me as it is seemingly everybody else. His whole focal point now that he has this knowledge with regards to the Mobius chair is to figure out a way to understand who the Joker is, where he came from, and what his whole story is about. Now, for those of you guys who want to continue off from where this whole idea about the Jokers continues, we have the, the story, the three Jokers down in the description. You can watch that.
that because that'll actually pick up immediately after this not directly and you know it wasn't really written until about five years after this story was published but in terms of chronology and in terms of fitting into what's going on with batman right now it fits in later What's going on guys? This is Rob and we are picking back up again with uh, Dark Side War. And in this instance, we're covering the Shazam one shot when Billy Batson gets a new pantheon of gods. Now, here's a crazy thing about this, right? This was probably one of the most anticipated and exciting things to come out of Dark Side War. And for those of you guys who are new to comic books, this is usually how it works, right? If you guys are familiar with comics, that's awesome. Bear with me here for a minute while we kind of get people who are not really familiar with comics caught up. So usually when it comes to a particular character or team, more often than not, uh, publishers or at least it used to be this way publishers would use like big landmark events as a way to kind of reshuffle and, and change things more recently it just kind of changes based on any one new particular writer right they just kind of introduce a story arc shift things up and then some kind of change gets made that just gets carried on from that point going forward with dark side war this is one of the instances when dc was just kind of like let's change things up for shazam right let's shift things around and let's let's introduce like a new pantheon of gods right now is as, is as good a time as any and so what we ended up getting was that during during the main Dark Side War event, following the death of Dark Side, there was this kind of ripple effect that was sent throughout essentially the the realm of the gods. And the result of this is that Billy Batson lost his connection to the old gods, Mercury and and Zeus and and so on and so forth, you know Solomon and whatnot. And he was replaced, or it really was replaced, with a with a new god. And even then, even inside of this, it's called the Six Gods of Antiquity, Antique Gods. That's kind of what they're referred to as. Now, when this happens, there's this kind of huge influx of all these different voices that come pouring into his head because for the most part there is new to this as he is right they're not really sure why they're bound to him and he's not really sure where these new gods came from it's suddenly just this huge influx of voices from all these various beings he's discovering new powers the ability to manipulate what's called the living fire as opposed to simply just being the the living lightning in a traditional sense and so it leads to them kind of goading him on and almost kind of just being like you know shout the word right you know say shazam different things like that and ultimately he initially does but then suddenly he's whisked away basically to the source. Now, the way that DC explains this is that gods in DC comics never actually die. Instead, they're basically taken to the source. Now, the important thing to understand here, this is kind of a Jack Kirby thing, but kind of not. Uh, the reason why I say that is, is back in the 70s, when Jack Kirby left Marvel and then went to DC comics, he had his whole fourth world, right? The idea of Jack Kirby doing that, to kind of sidetrack from this for a second, the idea of Jack Kirby introducing like Darkseid and all those guys in the old, the old uh, fourth world comics was to create like a wholly separate publication that didn't really have anything to do with the mainline DC comics. Kind of what you see now with like Vertigo, right? It's so like Lucifer and like the Spectre, things like that. Spectre crosses over more often than not, but you've never really seen a story where like Superman and Wonder Woman and the Justice League have to like align themselves with Lucifer Morningstar to face off against some kind of threat. Uh, but the idea with the fourth world was to make it wholly separate and unique. And the source was a part of that and all that kind of good stuff. The whole thing behind this is that following him leaving DC, all the fourth world stuff was rolled over into the main DC universe which is why you have dark side as part of like the the new 52 or you had dark side even before that he would face off against superman and things along those lines but the idea of gods dying and going to the source was a concept that jack kirby had thought of but not one that was routinely used and in fact, it really wouldn't be until Neil Gaiman's Eternals in Marvel Comics that that concept by Jack Kirby was actually used more prominently when you figured out that's where the Celestials go. That when Celestials in Marvel Comics die, they go to a kind of afterlife for the Celestials. They rejoin, quote unquote, Marvel's version of the source. That's kind of rolled over here, right? So it's one of those things where it was kind of created by DC, but not really, never, never really used. Then it was used by Marvel, then it was used by DC, but it all really kind of roots back to Jack Kirby, which is why he's considered to be one of the most landmark people out there. But what DC basically establishes here is that the old gods that Shazam was previously tied to are not really dead. They simply just rejoin the source. And at some point along the line, it basically opens the door for them to return in some form or fashion. So like Solomon, Hercules, Atlas, Zeus, Achilles, Mercury, they're not really tied to, uh, to Shazam anymore. Instead, he's got a whole new pantheon. But the crazy thing about this is that when Steve Orlando wrote this, it was designed to kind of springboard into a new series of Shazam stories. And a lot of that was because Shazam's comics is as interesting as he was and as hardcore as his fan following is, even they would have to admit the biggest problem with Billy Batson is the stories run stagnant, that they don't really 
do a lot with his character. He's there, but the last time he really had anything great was during the early 90s when you learned that like when he turns into Shazam, he turns into what he he remembers his father looking like or what he what he imagines his father to look like or something along those lines. But like that's it, right? There really haven't been a lot of meaningful moments behind Billy Batson. And so this was kind of designed to say, okay, well, let's just get rid of his old gods, replace him with new gods, and then go from there. And so what we're basically told is that in this interim moment, like this this split moment of a second between the time that, that Darkseid died and the time that Billy was given these new these new abilities, that time was kind of frozen to a degree, that it works differently when it comes to gods, but the idea is that the old gods were removed, the new gods were put in, but it was an incomplete process. That the wizard Shazam was the one who started it, but before the transition could be completed, that a villain named Zonus had basically struck, and he was kind of going through the process of essentially eliminating or taking over all these old gods, and then kind of empowering himself. And what we're basically told is that before Darkseid or any of those guys, there was just like this, this kind of butcher, right? This, this primal inspiration for suffering, right? He's basically given to us as like the original incarnation of evil. Now, again, this is not really designed to stand alongside Vertigo. It's designed to stand kind of alone from Vertigo, right? So that's why you don't really see any correlation here with regards to how this guy Zonas compares to like Lucifer Morningstar or something like that. Just no real, there's, DC doesn't just doesn't really cross those things over too much. But the idea is that Shazam having this new level of power would basically put him in a position to overpower Zonas, right? To kind of confine him back to where he's supposed to be. And so in the midst of that conversation, when he's talking to this woman, uh, Annapel, you know, as part of his new pantheon, suddenly he's yanked away and he ends up coming into uh, this guy who basically refers to himself as Siva, the dancer of destruction. And each one of these instances, each one of these gods that he comes across with kind of gives him a little, a little more of a piece of the puzzle, right? That in the sense that where Zonus had kind of gone on this campaign of, of cruelty and whatnot, that ultimately he was defeated, right? And when he was defeated, his cruelty was replaced with his son's cruelty, that his son became, you know, equally cruel to him. And so the result to this is that when he's met with these new powers, they kind of question him whether or not he could actually use these powers effectively, whether he could channel these abilities in the right way to actually defeat Zonus. Like, does this kid have the power to pull that off? But before he's really able to provide any credible evidence to the fact that he can do this outside of, you know, don't question what it is that I'm capable of. If that's, if you guys really see me as just some common mortal, then none of you really understand what I'm about. Then suddenly he's yanked away. And then he's brought to the presence of a woman by the name of Eight, who's the goddess of impulse. And the way she kind of explains herself here is really intriguing. She really establishes the idea that where the other people lend him particular abilities, she lends him a concept, right? She lends him the idea of being impulsive. And this could be looked at as a bad thing, but not necessarily. And the reason why is because whenever two foes go into conflict with each other, there's this kind of expectation in terms of how things will play out, right? In the sense that Zonus kind of being this ancient evil that has basically returned would look at Billy Batson in a lot of ways underestimate him, right? Or at the very least say, okay, if you're empowered by these gods that I'm familiar with, then knowing those gods as I do, I would expect you to act something in the same fashion because why else would they give you their powers? And even then he would look at him as simply just being an earthling and say, okay, as a person from earth, I can expect you to act like most earthlings. Impulsiveness kind of grants this sort of distraction, right? This idea that, you know, it kind of throws them off guard. Like, well, what is he going to do next? That kind of a thing, acting in an impulsive manner. And even then it's kind of expanded to a degree, right? The idea that, you know, this, this offering that she brings him could be something that could distract him from the beating he's going to get. Now, she's not really saying that insofar as, a, as something being beneficial. She's kind of saying it from the perspective of like, you're probably going to get wrecked, right? So not really having a whole lot of faith in him. But again, before he's able to kind of explain it to her, before he's able to offer any real indication of what it is that he's about, he's suddenly yanked away again. And he's almost brought to the to this guy who looks very similar to what we'd expect from like Surtur or even like Hephaestus from Greek mythology. Now he calls himself Ronmir, which he kind of says like, there is nobody else out there like me. Now the truth about this is he grants him what's called the living fire, which is more or less something akin to the living lightning. We didn't really, we don't really know the full effect of what his fire can do, the full on like level of durability and, and you know, how it compares to something like hellfire or something along those lines, because of course he's yanked away. And then suddenly he's brought before the wizard Shazam, who's facing off against Zonas. That with Zonas being free, that now he's going through and trying to take out each one of these individual gods. Now, when he shows up here, Billy of course watches the wizard get into this conflict. And then Zonas reveals his true nature in saying that he's he's basically Yuga Khan, right? The sire of evil, that he's the actual father of Darkseid. Now, this is not the first time that we've seen Yuga Khan in DC Comics. He existed long before this, but, but you know, the last time we'd previously seen him, he was locked away in the source wall. So presumably he had managed to find some way to escape. Now, the fact that he's here is one of these things where it's kind of like he intends to use his power combined with the powers of the other gods, presumably 
through Billy Batson to basically raise the world and kind of sees his son as a failure, right? The idea that like he's picking up where Darkseid left off, that Darkseid was just not strong enough to be able to overtake the world. He wasn't strong enough to be able to overtake Earth superheroes, but that Yuga Khan himself can. Now, the idea behind this was to kind of, again, springboard into like new stories that could be told coming in the aftermath of Darkseid War. And initially, like he just kind of takes off, right? Headed towards Earth. Now, Billy Batson, of course, transforms into the Wizard Shazam and brandishing the power of these new gods that he possesses goes toe to toe with Yuga Khan and is able to actually overpower him. Just by the, the strength, speed, durability, all that kind of stuff, he's able to overpower him. Even when you have Yuga Khan who's playing mind games and saying like, nothing you do can stop me and I will take your friends and I will put them in the kilns and you will watch them burn and you will smell them as they die. Like just all these, these horrible things that he's putting inside of his head. At the end of the day, none of it matters. And he's still able to present himself as the earth's mightiest mortal. Now, that's the point that Billy was trying to get across to all these new gods who questioned whether or not he would have the ability to overcome somebody like Yuga Khan and saying that the beauty of humanity is that we're not inherently limited, that a lot of races out there or a lot of beings out there may be confined to this kind of worldview or this view of their existence or something like that. And in that limitation, they quite literally cannot think outside the box, but humans are driven and powered by their imagination and the things that come with it. And so because of that, Billy doesn't really see any limits to his power. And it's one of these rare instances when you see him almost kind of like a, a level of power that seemingly has no real limit. Now, the reason why I say that is because there are big differences between the powers that Billy had before and the powers he has now. A lot of them are still the same, having like super strength and like super speed and things like that, right? The lightning of Mamoragon. That's, the, that's not really a huge difference in what we saw before, but having this kind of boldness that comes from eight, right? The ability to manipulate the power of the source, which came from Zonas. Having the ability to manipulate the fires of Ronmir. This was all brand new stuff, but no matter how you slice it, the result is that he overpowers Yuga Khan and then essentially knocks him out. And so when that happens, we have a couple things that happen. The first is that we learn the actual name of the wizard Shazam, who says his name's Mamoragon, right? So this is kind of a big reveal when it first happened. And that Mamoragon was basically the fifth god that Billy was getting his powers from. The sixth source of his power came from Yuga Khan himself. But the important takeaway from all this is that Billy basically had a new source of power that he could use in stories going forward. The downside of this is we never really saw anything come of it, right? Because Dark Side War ended and then DC Comics almost immediately picked up with the events of Rebirth and just kind of blew all this off, right? So Dark Side War was just kind of ignored seemingly across the board outside of reference to the fact that it happened. We didn't really see anything from Billy Batson outside of him showing up in like a Constantine comic, maybe some Wonder Woman stories, but nothing of any real significance to give us this idea that like Steve Orlando's vision of catapulting into like a new era of storytelling, focusing on Shazam with a whole new level of power. We never got to see that, right? Which is really disappointing when you think about it because it was a way to just breathe fresh life into a character who for quite some time has seemingly just kind of become stagnant. All right, what's going on guys? This is Rob and we are picking back up again with Dark Side War. This time we're covering the Flash one shot, the Flash tie into everything that's going on. Now keep in mind, these tie-ins take place between the ending of act two and the beginning of act three. But one thing that I wanna draw your attention to is a question that I got from a lot of you guys in the comment section who were asking how it is that like the Black Racer slash the Black Flash, because they're basically the same thing, how those characters relate to like Death of the Endless versus Necron and different things like that. Because any guy, anybody who's been reading DC comics for quite some time knows that there's all these different versions of death, right? Necron's like death for the Green Lanterns and like the Black Racer slash the Black Flash is death for the new gods and the Flashes and so on and so forth. So here's the important thing to understand here. In DC Comics, you only really have one absolute representation of death and that's death of the endless. That's really all it is. Everybody else is really more akin to like Charon, right? The fairy man from Greek mythology who would take people across the river Styx. That's really all they are in, in some form or fashion right? Necron is almost kind of like this being that sort of stands in this kind of purgatory-like place. Um, and that those individuals who basically die kind of pass through his realm, which sits as what most people refer to as a temporary way station until they actually go to the realm of death of the endless, where they live their eternal life and whatever afterlife awaits them. Uh, the Black Racer, the Black Flash, functions more or less the exact same way. The Black Racer aspect is what takes the new gods from their existence to the realm of death. And uh, the Black Flash, 
Smash does the exact same thing, but for speedsters. The difference is that when speedsters die, they join the speed force, right? That's kind of their afterlife. Um, now, a lot of this really came by way of Action Comics number 894, which was the aftermath to Blackest Night. And there's a point where Lex Luthor actually encounters Death of the Endless and asks the question about Blackest Night, right? Like, was that you? Were you the reason why people were coming back from the dead? And the answer that Death gives is not necessarily a direct one. Like, no, I didn't do that. Here's how it happened. That's not really the answer that we get. Instead, it's just kind of like, yeah, I saw all that go on and it seemed like everybody was having a lot of fun. People do escape the realm of death. I am pretty busy. And so what that really pointed to is the idea that Necron is not a representation of Death of the Endless as far as, as it pertains to the Green Lanterns. Necron is a wholly different entity of his own accord and that he was basically able to bring people from the realm of the dead into the realm of the living, hence the Blackest Night event. So it's not as though all these different avatars are just aspects of death. They're just beings that are out there. And this is really shown by the level of power they have. Necron can be defeated. The Black Racer, the Black Flash, they can be defeated. Death of the Endless cannot be defeated. If Death of the Endless were to show up and face off against the Justice League, they would all die. Like, she represents a concept, an ideology. And so the only way that Death of the Endless could truly perish is if all things simply just cease to exist. So having said that, this basically picks up with Barry Allen once he's bonded to the Black Racer and the revelation that he had basically killed Darkseid while he was imbued to the Black Racer using the anti-life equation as it was controlled by Mobius. And one of the things that's kind of hit on here is, is sort of a repeat of what we had previously seen in the sense that he doesn't really want to be separated from the Black Racer or the Black Flash, that he wants to control it. But this is kind of like an internal struggle because it's not as though Barry's operating of his own accord. And in fact, he manages to seize control if only for a moment and then breaks away from the Black Racer, right? Literally manages to separate himself and then he just runs as fast as he possibly can. Ah, uh, that, that he can basically outrun death. Now, this is the second time we've seen this. The first time we saw it, we didn't necessarily see it happen. It wasn't really until you got to like Flash Rebirth and the aftermath of Final Crisis that we actually found out what was going on, right? In the original Crisis on Infinite Earths event, Barry Allen was believed to have been dead, which paved the way for Wally West to become the new Flash over the course of the entirety of the 90s and the mid to late 2000s. But when Barry Allen came back in 2009 with Final Crisis, and then that was followed up with Flash Rebirth by Jeff Johns, it basically gave us this, this depiction or, or kind of established to us that following the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths, that Barry Allen had just been outrunning death all this time. And that during the events of Final Crisis, he was able to literally escape the, the speed force and basically get away from death. And so because of that, Barry outrunning death, this is not a new concept, but it's also a little bit different here because of the fact that there's all, this almost kind of understanding between the two of them in the sense that it's one of these things where death sort of plays these games and says like, or at least uh, the Black Racer plays these games and says, if, if Darkseid himself could not conquer me, what chance do you think you have? And even kind of makes these things of like, death is precious to you, death created you, right? Death created you when it took her, right? When it took your mom, Nora Allen. Now, of course we know that Eobard Thawne killed Nora Allen, but death was kind of like, the follow-up, right? Like she died and then she was whisked away by death. But it's one of these things where notice that, uh, that the Black Racer doesn't really say me. He doesn't say like, you know, when I took her, right? I am precious to you. I created you. That's not really what, what's being said here. It's death did this, right? So whisking Barry Allen off to the realm of death is more or less what, what this whole thing is. But in that moment, he has this kind of, of he kind of gets this back and forth and he actually ends up not really coming to terms with the Black Racer, but kind of having this bit of a conversation with the Black Racer. And this is a really cool moment here, right? Because what ends up happening is the Black Racer basically says, like, this is Central City, right? When they kind of stop for a minute, he says, like, this is Central City, right? This is the home of the Flash, that which the Flash fought and protected for eons, right? 2.5 million people live here. Now, one of the things that the Black Racer says is, like, I am what you need to learn if life is to continue. Now, look at the streets that you would protect. This is an important thing here because Barry Allen has largely just ran away from death. That's the story of Barry Allen. There is truth to the statement that death created Barry. There is an absolute truth there that in the aftermath of Barry Allen's mom dying, that, that her death and the concept of death have basically dominated his life, right? The entire Flashpoint event was based on him trying to go back in time and save his mom's life and keep her from dying, which he succeeded in doing, and then turn the whole world upside down in an alternate timeline. But like Crisis on Infinite Earths, outrunning death for 20 years until he managed to come back, constantly trying to get away from death, just refusing to die. And it's one of these things where it's like, this has to happen, right? Like death has to exist and death has to have a host. And Black Racer kind of races off, you know, just kind of takes off and is like, I'm going to kill everybody. And it's like, you know, can Barry Allen possibly stop this from happening? And as Barry does this and as Barry chases down this Black Racer and bears witness to all these various people who were dying, Barry comes to the realization that this has to happen, that if death does not have a host, that death would just 
run rampant. There'd be nobody to curtail death. There'd be nobody to reel it in. Nobody to keep it kind of chained and, and, you know, and, and operating the way it's supposed to. Now, there's precedence for this. We saw that with Hal Jordan when he was bonded to the Spectre, right? In the aftermath of like Emerald Twilight and all that kind of stuff, that Hal Jordan became the new host for the Spectre. And then eventually they were separated and the Spectre had no host. And so the Spectre went on a warpath, right? The representation of God's vengeance just went on this absolute warpath. And so the idea is that if Black Racer functions more or less the same way, even if it's only a concept or, or something akin to the idea of death, if there's no one there to chain it, it would just run rampant because all it does is kill people. And so there'd be no discerning factor there. There'd be no instance of like, you know, this guy's 26 years old in the prime of his life. There's nothing wrong with him. He didn't walk in front of a vehicle or anything like that. It's not his time. And death would just snatch him up because death just kills, right? And it would kill indiscriminately. And so because of that, it's one of these things where Barry basically realizes that the only way for this to work, right? The only way for him to successfully bond to, to the Black Racer is for him to take a life, to kind of cement the relationship between the two. That with Barry Allen taking a life using the scythe of the Black Racer, that in turn, it would make him into the new Black Racer, right? He would basically become the new living embodiment for the Black Flash, Black Racer, what have you. And so he actually ends up going directly to Iris West. Now, it's not really done with the intention of killing Iris West. That's not his goal here. The reason why he ran to Iris West and it's something that she begins to pick up on when he basically brands the scythe and transforms into the Black Flash is she realizes you came here because you know I'm the only one that can stop you, right? I'm the only one that can keep you from doing this. I'm the only one that can pull you back from the brink. If this was anybody else, if it was anybody else out there in the world, you would have struck them down with a scythe and it would have been the end of them. They would have died and you would officially become the Black Racer. But even if only on a subconscious level, you knew that I could pull you back. You couldn't bring yourself to kill me. And so in that moment, the idea of Barry being taken over by the Black Black Racer is temporarily halted. And the Black Racer, even in an effort to kind of tempt Barry Allen, jumps like kind of manifests in different forms. Then like in turn, what would happen? You know, maybe I should just see what would happen if Gorilla Grodd had my power, what kind of pandemonium and chaos that he could bring to this place. And so Barry kind of says, okay, fine. So just one life. All I have to do is take one life and then it'll cement us. And, and the Black Racer's like, yes. And he's like, okay, you got it. I'm gonna kill you. And immediately chases after the Black Racer, right? Now, when this happens, the Black Racer's like, what? <laughs> That's not how this is supposed to be, right? That's not how this is supposed to work. And, and like immediately just goes fleeing, right? So like the shoe is totally on the other foot and it's like begging Barry Allen to stop. Now, ultimately Barry Allen drawing the scythe back does manage to kill the Black Racer, right? He kills the Black Flash. The problem with this is that as soon as that happens, he's almost kind of greeted with like this sort of depiction of a mom, right? This kind of, you know, uh, afterlife-esque concept. But when he kills the Black Racer, like the Black Racer as an ideology, right? The, the kind of representation of death is just totally unhinged, right? It's completely and totally released. Death is 100% free for the first time. Now, remember, this is kind of a, this is kind of DC playing it fast and loose, right? DC saying, oh yeah, the Black Racer kind of is, or maybe is not a version of death. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can just kind of take it for what it's worth. But what it basically means is it's almost a repeat of what we saw with like the Spectre and Hal Jordan, that because there's nobody anchoring it there, Barry Allen realizes death has to have a host. Death has to be, has to be bonded to someone. That if it's not bonded to anybody, because Darkseid's no longer alive to control Whole death, death would just run unfettered across all of existence and just kill every single person that it can possibly come across. And so Barry ultimately makes the sacrifice, right? He says, fine, then I will do what I have to do, right? In this instance, I will rebond myself to the Black Racer and I will officially become the new harbinger of death. And that's what he does, right? He combines his power with the Black Racer and goes forward accordingly. In this video, we are covering Dark Side War uh, Green Lantern. The Green Lantern tie-in for Dark Side War, this was actually one of my favorites. This was one of my favorite stories to come out of the whole Dark Side War event. The only thing that I didn't like about it is kind of how it ended, and you guys will see what I'm talking about as we get closer to it. But in the aftermath of Dark Side basically being killed at the hands of the Anti-Monitor, one of the things that we talked about was that there was nobody left to lead the Parademons. And even within the sphere of Apocalypse itself, the planet that Dark Side lives on, there's a bit of a civil war going on. Now that'll be, that'll be something that we cover uh, with the Lex Luthor tie-in. We'll talk about that when we cross that bridge. But the parademons that kind of existed out there have basically consolidated onto the planet of Oa. Now, this is not arbitrary, right? It's not doing it just for the sake of telling a story. It actually makes sense. And the reason why is because Oa is home to the central power battery for the Green Lanterns. Now, I would say that in terms of them going after the green central power battery, as opposed to like the Red Lanterns or like the Indigo Tribe, which I don't think the Indigo Tribe actually has a central, po uh, central power battery, or going after like the, the central power 
power battery of the orange lantern who is statistically the most uh, the most powerful of all the lanterns out there this is just done for the sake of the story right just because green lantern was a member of the justice league and you know just for the sake of telling a story i think it would have been cooler if all the parademons had gone after the red lanterns and, and managed to like take them all over or something like that but the important thing here is that with all the parademons basically arriving on earth this turned out to be a war of attrition right because you have john stewart who contacts hal jordan and basically sends him a message and what he says here is that this kind of mother box appeared outside of oa sensing the central power battery and because the central power battery was so astronomically powerful that it basically tried to bond itself with the power battery which it ultimately ended up doing the various green lanterns out there fought against it as best they could but they all fell now if the parademons had all attacked oa seemingly at the same time the green lanterns actually probably would have stood a better chance but because of the fact that it was done in waves so it would be like a wave of parademons when they were defeated another wave of parademons would show up then another wave and another wave and another wave it was basically a war of attrition right it was just kind of this almost endless onslaught of forces just coming over and over and over again and because it was a new wave of parademons it was unexhausted parademons facing off against an exhausted green lantern core and so as the result of that all these green lanterns basically ended up failing they ended up you know being defeated a lot of them were killed you know most of the green lanterns were killed those those green lanterns who survived and even the guardians of the universe were basically taken by the mother box and they were conscripted into becoming parademons themselves so they were transmogrified into becoming these forces that kind of helped to bolster their ranks and that's one of the things that makes dark side so dangerous when he was alive anyway and the nature of the parademons is it's it's, it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one ratio like for every person who falls they become a parademon it's not necessarily like that but i would say it's probably something like a one to five ratio so for every five people who fall one of them becomes a parademon or something along those lines which still is a huge increase in number as time goes on and so hal jordan is basically racing to this place as fast as he possibly can and so what, what you end up doing is kind of sidetracking for a second with this bit of an inner monologue between hal jordan and himself and for the most part if you're reading this like if you go and you buy this on comiXology you can largely skip over this segment but i do want to cover this because this is going to be a kind of thing that sort of goes on intermittently over the course of this story and so with this little bit of a discussion it kind of follows after the death of hal jordan's father and him and his young as his younger self basically lighting a candle for for his father and it's kind of hal jordan coming to terms with the death of his dad because that's something that had never truly really happened over the course of the the green lantern mythos even when jeff johns was writing it it was always kind of like a background thing and it was always like i'm going to learn the lessons about my father and i'm going to champion him and he was a great man but in terms of how jordan actually like sitting down and saying okay so my dad died. This is something that's basically governed every decision-making factor of my life and having to come to terms with it, it's never really happened before. And so that's why this was so cool. And it's one of the reasons why it was my favorite tie in here because it's basically Hal Jordan kind of having an inner monologue and inner discussion with himself. And what his younger child self does is he kind of asks the question about church, right? That his dad was Catholic, but his dad never really took him to church because his dad never really never really considered it to be important. And it's one of these things where it's like, you know, I mean, he was, he, he never really believed in God or anything like that. And I guess you kind of would have thought it would have made sense but his dad's his dad's philosophy was believing in god doesn't help me when i'm up there flying right god's not flying my jets he's not controlling the engines or anything like that it's myself my ingenuity my ability to understand what it is that i'm doing to control all of that and that's why he's kind of like you know when his when his plane went down god was supposed to catch him right like isn't that what god's supposed to do god's supposed to catch us when we fall and so in essence hal jordan had kind of a, a existential crisis with regards to like his place in the universe's understanding of god which usually Usually happens when you're a child right which, which usually happens when you're a little kid and so this this child version of himself begins to lash out now again this is important here because tom king's the one writing this and while tom king can kind of be a little full of himself when he's writing comics at this point in time he wasn't he was he was still a great comic book writer who hadn't got got high on his own supply so to speak you know got uh you know kind of got addicted to his own success more or less <laughs> and so the the result of this is that when it comes to kids kids usually try to reconcile the concept of god the only way they know how and that's why a lot of adults will experience this crisis on what their religious uh, what their religious faith really means in the face of children because kids ask these questions that adults may have at some point asked and simply just forgot but it basically challenges everything adults believe right like if god is real then what was god doing before before everything was created who created god was god always there like how does all that kind of stuff come into play and those are pretty basic questions but those basic questions have profound impacts on people's faith and that's what happens here with how jordan as a 
little kid. Why didn't God save my dad? If God cares about us, if God truly loves us, why doesn't he save us? If people liken God to parents and they say, well, God loving, loving us as humans is like me loving you as a parent, then it's like, would you let me die? And if you wouldn't let me die, why would God let me die? Why would God just sit up there and watch? Why would God just take refuge in that? Just kind of let that thing happen. And those are the kind of struggles that a lot of kids deal with and they're legitimate questions to ask, right? And so Hal Jordan as an adult self kind of chimes in and says, well, you're not wrong. When your dad died, God really was just watching, just like you were watching, right? And it's like, God's got no choice but to watch. He has to, he has to go over that moment over and over and over again. He has to just let those things happen. And the reason why is because God gave humanity free will. God gave us the ability to create our own choices, to engage in our own actions of what use would life be if it was preordained, if we knew what was going to happen, or if our actions were somehow set in stone, if it was just kind of in existence in that way. And that's where you run into a lot of, of I wouldn't really say contradiction, but where you run into a lot of issues in terms of the, the fallibility or the infallibility of God, different things like that. It's why I always liken God to more of a prime mover, right? God just set things in motion and then whatever happens, happens, right? He's a kid with an ant farm. He's got no kind of plan whatsoever. And so because of that, it's, it's one of these things where that's, that's kind of the depiction that Hal Jordan puts forward here, that we as human beings, we have our own will. We have our own choice on what it is that we do and do not engage in in this life. And that was the gift given to us by God. But it doesn't mean that if we somehow turn our back on God, that things are going to get worse for us, right? It's not necessarily, you know, functioning in that kind of linear capacity. When you believe in God, good things happen. When you don't, bad things happen. It doesn't necessarily work that way. That it's just things in this life happen. And sometimes there's nothing we can do about it. It's just the way things work. And so at the end of the day, whether God is truly out there or not would have no bearing on whether or not your father died for by whatever manner and whatever means our father basically kicked the bucket, right? He ended up perishing. And so because of that, it's not really our place to blame God because it wasn't really God's purpose to come down and save him anyway, right? And so again, I wouldn't go as far as to say that in the aftermath of all this, Hal Jordan is a born again Christian, but I will go as far as to say that Hal Jordan almost kind of purports this idea that humans are greater than God. And the reason why is because Hal Jordan makes this kind of comparative in saying that if humans have free will, which is we can do anything we want with this life that we live and God is bound to eternally watch and just simply monitor how things unfold, then God cannot step in, right? God is bound by the rules that he created, right? Which is humans have the ability to live their lives as they see fit. I cannot intervene. That's God's, that's the chains around God. And so it's one of these things where it's like, we are greater than God because we can do things that God can't do. We can just do whatever we want with our life. God doesn't have that opportunity. He doesn't have that ability. And so because of that, where you might think that we go to church to worship God, the reality is God comes to church to worship us because God's envious of us. God's envious of what we can and cannot do, of the kind of freedom that we have in this life that we live. And so that's an important thing for Hal Jordan to have kind of come to terms with because it removes the idea from like, if God cared, he would have saved my dad. You know, if I was any measure of a man, I would have saved my dad. It kind of cuts him loose from all that. And it says like, sometimes things in this life just happen. And as much as we would love to stop them, and as much as we would love to blame people for it, it just doesn't work that way, right? I mean, I know you guys know, as Americans, we're not really good at taking responsibility for ourselves. We're really good at blaming people. <laughs> that's kind of a staple of American culture, right? You know, if things go south, just blame somebody else. And that's kind of how we do things here, right? And so because of that, it's it's, it's kind of uh, turning his back on the nature of what it means to have been in that mentality his entire life, which is to say, sometimes things just happen. And it's not as though God has it out for us. He's not trying to punish us or anything like that. It's just the way things unfold, right? So again, a bit of an existential crisis that was going on there. Now, while he was having that bit of an existential crisis, he was kind of just facing off against all these parademons on Oa and attacking them as best he could. The reality is that he was just attacking them head on. So like trying to kill them using his powers, things like that. The result of this is that the energy of the central power battery had been absorbed by the mother box. So eventually his ring will run out of a charge, right? And so when it does, he'll be consumed and destroyed and turned into a parademon if he's not just killed. And so because that how Jordan's like, okay, if this is the way the game gets played, then we'll play this game, right? If what the mother box wants is somebody to be their God, if what mother box wants is somebody to attain all that power, everything that makes the, the, the force of will what it is, right? The, uh, the green lantern central power battery combined with the power of the source, then I will be that person. I will become that God. And he basically just surrenders himself to this mother box slash central power battery and essentially gains the power of the source, right? Hal Jordan definitively becomes God here. Specifically, he becomes the God of light. Now, the reality is that's just a ceremonial title. There's no real difference between like Hal Jordan here right now as the God of light and like, you know, Kyle Rayner when he becomes the White Lantern 
or like Superman 1 million when he goes and spends uh, spends time with the source. By all standards of measurement, they are all in effect the same thing. And in fact, we're even told that, right? That he can do anything now. There's nothing he can't do. He can control the stars. He can create life. He can do all kinds of stuff. And he actually does that, right? Because as he gains this power and as he realizes what it is that he can and cannot do, he kind of harkens back to the sort of internal struggle that he has with himself, which is what is it that I'm, that I'm supposed to do with this kind of power that I have? Sure, I could intervene and I could fix the universe's problems and I can make everything okay. The problem with this is it's not my job to do that. It's the job of people to fix their lives. It's the job of people to get it together. It's the job of the universe to solve its own problems. Hence the nature of free will. If I impose my will on other people, then it's going to lead me right back to where I was before. And when I say that, I'm talking about Hal Jordan when he was like zero hour crisis in time, when he was possessed by parallax, when he had the power of God, he tried to bend the universe to his womb. And in fact, he actually did. He blinked it out of existence and brought it back, right? So we've seen what happens when Hal Jordan becomes consumed by the power that he has. And when he truly becomes God, then he ends up being bent. Now at that point in time, he was also possessed. So you could make a legitimate argument that Hal Jordan, as he exists now as the God of light, is not the same as he was during zero hour crisis in time back in the 1990s, when he basically wiped out existence and then brought it back, right? You could, you could make a good case that they're not the same thing. And he could actually be a benevolent God here, right? He could be a, a kind and enlightened God, but regardless, he refuses to accept it. And so he says, okay, fine. If this is the case, then the only time I'm going to use this power is to basically set everything back. So I'm going to undo the parademons arriving here on Oa. I'm going to resurrect everybody who died and set everything back to the way that it was before. Then he in turn instructs the mother box to destroy itself, right? And to place its energy back inside of the central power battery. In essence, nothing comes out of this. Nothing comes out of the story. Hal Jordan doesn't come away any more powerful than he was when he, when he was, you know, when he first went into it, right? The only real takeaway from this is that in this time that he had all this power, he realized what Batman was going to do with the Mobius chair. And there's like kind of on a course to, to Gotham city to stop it. That was the big disappointment here. That was the biggest disappointment behind all of this is that it would have been cool to see Hal Jordan's power elevated to a higher level. Now we can largely assume that Jeff Johns, Robert Venditti, those guys who were going to be working on Green Lantern, that they kind of intended to do that anyway, that at the time the story was being written, we were what, maybe like a year and a half, two years out from the beginning of like Green Lantern, or like Hal Jordan, and the Green Lantern Corps as part of DC Rebirth. And the first thing they did in that story is they had Hal Jordan craft a ring out of his own willpower, right? So like, it was cool to see that, to see like his will elevated to higher levels, to see him becoming more powerful there. And, and even then, there really isn't a whole lot of a story you can tell with a man who becomes God. It's why Kyle Rayner was the White Lantern God, Space Jesus Messiah guy for a little while, and then lost it all, right? Because it's great for a story arc, but you can't do anything long-term with it because then you run into like the Franklin Richards effect. Well, if something goes wrong, why doesn't Hal Jordan just fix it, right? And so ultimately, you know, you end up kind of boxing yourself into a corner. Okay, so we are picking up with the conclusion here of Dark Side War. And there's a couple things that I want to talk about here. One, I kind of like doing these older DC stories, the ones that we just never covered, right? That we've heard about, that we've talked about a million times, but never actually covered here, like Trinity War, um, Forever Evil. Like, we've never really covered those stories. I'm not going to cover Future's End because that story sucks. Uh, I read it and it does blow balls. But um, I kind of like, you know, there's some stuff from the New 52 in DC Comics that's still really good that we never really got around to covering. Um, so I think I might kind of experiment with that a little bit. You know, as you guys know, I love to experiment with you guys and find out what you guys love. Cause I know there's like 500 of you who are replying in the comics. We'll watch anything you post Rob, but then there's like another, however many hundred thousand people or really just subscriber count. Right. So like 1.9 million people that I'm trying to appeal to <laughs> and even other people beyond that. Right. So doing a YouTube channel or growing a YouTube channel is all about reaching out to an audience that you have and the audience you don't have. So, uh, so with this, with the conclusion of dark side war, we kind of pick up in the aftermath, so to speak of green lantern, right? It's kind of the aftermath of pretty much all the tie-ins. We can cover the one for Lex Luthor. The reality is that nothing really happens in that tie-in. Um, he just kind of comes into his own and fully embraces the power of like the Omega Sanction, right? So like basically becomes full on dark side for the most part, not in, in a direct sense, not in a literal sense, but the power of dark side. And like, that's it. That, that's, that's really all you get. Honestly, Lex Luthor in this is a lot more interesting than he is in his own in his own one shot. But uh, Green Lantern meeting with Batman is, is really kind of like trying to talk Batman out of the Mobius chair, right? And as we know, Batman doesn't want to leave the chair because in one in one part of this, he's kind of addicted to it. All the knowledge that it feeds him, his ability to fight crime as he sees it. But the other part of that is that when he tries to leave, he seemingly physically can't. It's one of these interesting scenarios, but in the middle of their conversation, 
conversation, suddenly Batman chimes in and says, we need to get out of here. We got to go to Wonder Woman uh, because right now Superman's just kind of losing his mind. Now, one of the things to remember is that when Superman was bathed in the fire pits of Apocalypse by Lex Luthor in order to help him regain his powers, because the idea was the, the pits are, are fire, right? They're solar pits, so they should rejuvenate Superman. Then he came out corrupted, right? He came out corrupted both in mind and in body. And so his physical powers, his physical abilities aren't really the same they were before. He doesn't really have the same weaknesses. And we'll find out more about that here in a little bit. But in terms of his mind, he's more or less just kind of bent through chaos and, and madness and anger and wrath, right? Now, Wonder Woman gets the upper hand and manages to bring that in pretty quickly by just wrapping him with the lasso of truth and then just being like, who are you? You know, and he's like, I'm Superman, you know, and that's basically it. Superman's kind of brought back down. And that was really the point. Uh, I know that on the surface, you can kind of look at that and just be like, well, that's lackluster. This is not designed to be a Dan Jurgens death of Superman event where like he comes back with a whole new host of powers. It wasn't really meant to be that way. And one of the things to keep in mind is that DC Comics was like, this story literally leads directly into DC Rebirth. And so we already knew that the Adventures of Superman and Lois Lane by Dan Jurgens was already on the table and it was already being written and being published. So we knew the idea of blending this version of Superman with the pre-crisis Superman was the intention DC had in the first place. And so it wouldn't really make a whole lot of sense to give him a whole new set of powers only to wipe those away, then replace them with the old powers and then call it a day, right? To do that like that, right? To do it within the span of like a year or so. Usually when comics do that, it'll be like a couple years maybe or so before they before they shift things up. Um, so it was just a little too quick of a turnaround. The other part of this is that you have Jessica Cruz, you've got Cyborg, and you've got the master escape artist, Mr. Miracle, basically heading to Bell Reef Prison. And the reason for this is that while Big Bard is creating a distraction for the guards up top, the idea of, of these three guys is to basically get to the cells of Ultraman and Superwoman. Now, Ultraman and Superwoman, and here's one of the biggest travesties of DC Comics, really like I would say in the last half of the 20th century, is they never explored Earth 3. They never really explored the crime syndicate. We know they're doing it now. They're releasing a series coming up soon that's focused on Earth 3. And presumably it'll give us the story of like how Earth 3 got to the way that it was. It'll give us the ins and outs of how twisted it is and different things like that. Uh, so it'll be kind of cool to see that unfold. But up to this point, all we knew about these characters is that like Ultraman gets his powers from Kryptonite instead of solar energy and that Superwoman is basically Lois Lane, right? It's just different things along those lines just these small little tidbits here and there from this this alternate reality with regards to power ring of course that's the a green lantern ring from earth 3 that's possessed by the vengeful spirit of volthoom or at least one aspect of volthoom so we know little things about that cyborg is basically grid he's like an evil cyborg in that in that universe but we don't really know a whole lot and so getting some stuff out of this is going to be really really cool the problem with this is that as jessica cruz has always been someone who struggled to contain the power of her ring one because of the fact that the ring has a will of its own and is always trying to dominate dominate the will of Jessica Cruz, and two, because she lacks so much confidence and struggles with so much anxiety that it basically takes away from her willpower, her ability to actually overcome fear. It basically means the ring ends up overtaking Jessica Cruz, and then she's fully under control of Vothum, operating under the name of Power Ring. Now, of course, once Superman is brought back down by Wonder Woman and they meet with Batman, then one of the little things that we get here, and, and it's not really important because of the nature of the comic, is that the current structure of Superman's body, the power he possesses, is breaking him down and is inevitably killing him. That's not really relevant because we know he doesn't die just because of the fact that stories we've covered. <laughs> but uh, what they end up doing is after they 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 kind of get into the cell of, of Ultraman, Ultraman is actually in a state of panic and freaking out because of the fact that, that Mobius, you know, Anti-Monitor is currently on Earth and Ultraman believes that Mobius knows that he's talking about him, right? Like anything that could possibly draw the attention of Mobius is enough to scare the heck out of Ultraman. And that's one of the important things to understand. Ultraman, for all the power he possessed, it really was just all glitz and glamour, right? It was it was just smoke and mirrors. That's all it was. It was just kind of like, look at me, I'm Ultraman, I have all this power. But it was just a false confidence, right? And that kind of comes to bear in the fact that while while they faced off against Mobius and he did like eradicate their world, at the same time, if he really was as powerful and really was as confident as he put himself off to be, then he wouldn't be in this current state. Now, some of this also has to do with the fact that because he has not really consumed any kind of green kryptonite, his powers are dwindling in the same way that if Superman's not exposed to a yellow sun, his powers will drop off in the same way. But when it comes to, to Superwoman, she's actually pregnant, right? She's kind of knocked up. Now we knew that was the case kind of going through just because of the fact that, you know, she was, she was technically married to Ultraman, but was essentially sleeping behind his back, which kind of makes sense when you're from Earth 3, all you do is just terrible things. And so when that, when that happens, you have Cyborg who basically tries to override the ring of Jessica Cruz. That doesn't work. And in fact, a, a portion of his essence is trapped inside the ring. And then he's fully corrupted by the power of grid in essence. And then while all that's going on, Mobius finally emerges in what I would refer to as his perfect form, right? Now,
Now, when Mobius finally emerges, you end up having the cell wall kind of blown open, and that's when Owlman shows up, right? The Earth 3 version of Batman, who's basically like an evil version of Bruce. The reality of this is even when you take into account Dark Knight's Metal by Scott Snyder, I still say Owlman is probably one of the coolest versions of Batman who exist out there. Again, we don't really know a whole lot about him. We don't really see a whole lot about his character. We will as time goes on. But of course, having this green kryptonite in the possession of Superman, which was technically created by Lex Luthor or captured by Lex Luthor, one, it doesn't affect Superman in his current corrupted form, which is one of the things that's kind of given to us is that Superman is not vulnerable to kryptonite in this current form. Two, when it's given to uh, Ultraman, it's like a drug. Like literally, it's like his version of crack. Like he's scratching, you know, y'all got any more of them kryptonites? Like, that's basically what it is, right? And so as soon as he consumes it, he kind of reverts back to his normal self. And the whole the whole meeting that goes on here, the reason why these two groups are together is because Mobius was powerful enough to eradicate Earth-3, and he's powerful enough to eradicate the main DC universe. The only way for these heroes to come out on top, or at least these characters anyway, to come out on top is for them to team up, right? For the villains of the crime syndicate to team up with the heroes of the Justice League. Now understand, neither one of these groups is too keen on this idea, right? Neither one of them is like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's cool. They're pretty cool guys, right? I mean, you know, I'd have a beer with Superman, says Owlman. That's never going to happen, right? Like, <laughs> they, they don't really want to work together. But the reality is they stand more to lose by working separately than they than they do by working in unison. Now, while that's happening, the Anti-Monitor is kind of fulfilling its purpose, right? We can just call him Anti-Monitor. Some people might want to split hairs and call him Mobius. It really is all just the same thing, right? Tomato, tomato. And the whole point behind Mobius as he exists here, he just relishes in destruction and eradicating life, right? Just killing and, and destroying things right? Kind of like a, an evil, benevolent god. And it was really just Jeff John's way of taking the Anti-Monitor as we knew him and tying him directly into Mobius and kind of bridging the gap between the original Crisis on Infinite Earth's depiction of Anti-Monitor and the way we see him here, especially when it came to new readers, but even those who were asking questions coming in the aftermath of like Sinestro Core War and things along those lines. And so you have the various heroes who show up here and do what they can. And then you have the crime syndicate who were just like, all we want to do is kill Mobius because he eradicated our world. And for the most part, they're doing what they can where they can, but they are quite literally fighting the uh, fighting a guy with the power of a god, right? A man with the power to eradicate entire universes. Now, it's not one of these things that's on the scale of like uh, the living tribunal where he just snaps his fingers and the universe is gone, right? It's, it certainly takes time and it takes a lot of energy, but the important takeaway from this is he's well beyond the power of the Justice League. And so where you end up having like Jessica Cruz possessed by Volthoom who's doing her thing, that one of the things that happens here is that you end up seeing the Green Lantern Corps arrive. Now, the Green Lantern core showing up here is really more of like returning the favor of Hal Jordan showing up to uh, Oa and then basically saving the Green Lantern Corps from what was essentially their deaths and then it's kind of undoing everything using a super powerful ring. So that's one of the reasons why we uh, why we cover that particular tie-in, at least in order to make this moment make sense. But understand here, even the arrival of the Green Lantern Corps is not enough to really turn the tide of the battle. And in fact, like there's this massive amount of energy that the Anti-Monitor lets off that wipes out a huge portion of the, of the, the Green Lantern Corps that's here and the rings immediately take off and start looking for replacements. Now, while this battle with Mobius or the Anti-Monitor is currently taking place, Steve Trevor is suddenly snatched up by Grail. And the important thing about that is Grail actually has a plan for Steve Trevor and, and a, a particular intention she that she wants as far as using him goes. But while that goes on, you have Mobius who ultimately attacks Ultraman and basically talks a little bit of smack to him and then starts to kill him. And where the, the, where the Flash could step in and the Flash could actually intervene and save the life of Ultraman, the reality is he can't. And the reason why is because while he does have a new host of powers, he and the Black Racer are for the most part kind of working in unison. Not in the sense that like they have the same goal, but in the sense that like one will is able to sort of dominate the other depending on the circumstance. And because the entire existence of the Black Racer is to monitor and wait for death uh, and to basically whisk those individuals who are supposed to die away to perdition, it doesn't move and it doesn't allow Barry Allen to move. So Barry Allen cannot step in and save Ultraman, despite the fact that Ultraman being there would be a huge boon for the superheroes in this in this battle because he's basically an alternate reality version of Superman, right? So it's like having two Supermen on the chessboard. You could do a lot of damage with these guys. Now, there is a bit of a saving grace that comes in in the sense that once Mobius kills Ultraman, then you have the arrival of Lex Luthor, who's, who basically seizes control of all the parademons, right? Who's taken over the parademons of Apocalypse and then is using them as his own personal army. Now, something else to understand, Lex Luthor has all the power of Darkseid here. He's got all this power of Darkseid, but one of the things that Jeff Johns really sort of sort of gives us is this idea that while we looked at the beginning of Dark Side War and we basically saw Dark Side and Mobius facing off against each other and Mobius getting the upper hand but seemingly there being a kind of stalemate there that what it looks like is that in this situation once he's basically
basically freed of the influence of the anti-life equation that Mobius is basically in his perfect form, right? He's exceedingly powerful. Now, the other part of this though, is we kind of have to take Lex Luthor at face value. Lex Luthor, despite how intelligent he is and how capable he is, this is the first time he's really wielding a power like this. And so it would be pretty disingenuous to say that like Lex Luthor is on par with Darkseid, not in a perfect sense, right? Darkseid wielded his power for eons, eons and eons and eons and eons. He explored every facet of the Omega Sanction and knew exactly how to use it with surgical precision. When it comes to somebody like Lex Luthor, he's just using it as best he can, right? <laughs> it's blasts of energy, it's the Omega Beams, right? It's the kind of general thing that he's seen Darkseid do because he's still sort of learning how to use this power as he has it. And so this, this kind of lack of experience with the ability he wields basically comes to bear when he faces off against the against Mobius. And there is a kind of uh, you know, stalemate to a degree, but it's also pretty obvious that Mobius is going to get the upper hand in this bit of a conflict here. Because one of the things to notice is that when it comes to the fight between these two, Lex Luthor is largely resigning himself to physical attacks as opposed to using more ranged attacks against somebody like Anti-Monitor, which proved to be more successful with Darkseid, right? Darkseid used that exceedingly well to his advantage. Also because Darkseid was more battle hardened, right? He was more like, he was more of a master strategist when it came to combat. It doesn't mean Lex Luthor cannot be that way, but there's a difference between a person who's been fighting wars for millions and millions of years and a person who's been doing it for like 35 years or so. And so while that battle is taking place, kind of jumping back over to Batman and to Wonder Woman and Superwoman and Jessica Cruz, or really Volthoom if you want to call her that, Batman using the Mobius chair starts to realize the plan of what it is that Grail's shooting for, but also the significance of the baby that uh, that Superwoman is knocked up with. And so what ends up happening is that once she begins the birthing process and starts to have this baby, that as it comes out and as it's, as it's emerged, it comes out as a baby the way that you would expect it to. But Grail suddenly arrives on the scene here. And that's when like Black Racer Flash is like, you should all run. And again, the whole reason why he's not moving is he's basically waiting for death. He's waiting for somebody to die, right? Like a, a, a person or people are going to die here. And the Black Racer is simply waiting for his time to pull him away. And so what ends up happening is that when the baby's born from Superwoman, that is one of these things where like everybody kind of starts to panic, right? And that's because one, this baby is basically a weapon that, uh, that, that Superwoman intends to use. Two, it's actually something that Grail intends to take. And three, Steve Trevor's back. But Steve Trevor is completely imbued with the power of what is in effect, the anti-life equation combined with whatever power she was able to garner from Darkseid. And so Steve Trevor showing up here, he immediately eradicates Mobius, right? Just like that. Mobius is completely and totally destroyed. Now, the reason why this happens is because if Steve Trevor is infused with anti-life, then seemingly it'd be totally possible for him to just eradicate anybody who's living, right? To basically just destroy their essence. But something else that goes on here is that Superman attacked Mobius prior to this point and basically just dispelled all the apocalyptic energy within his body. That was something that I kind of missed when it happened. Um, that does need to be said for those of you guys who were kind of curious why Superman looks the, you know, looks back to normal. So that, that one's, that part's pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. But in effect with Mobius basically gone and eradicated in a pretty lackluster way, if I'm being honest with you guys, the biggest threat now turns directly to Steve Trevor and then Grail. Now there's also another part of this plan that Grail has, which is pretty amazing, right? It's a pretty genius plan that she has for herself. Single-handedly, she goes through and basically just takes out every single member of the Justice League. And even when the Green Lantern comes, the Green Lantern Corps come in and they try to basically lock her down in a cage, because of the fact that her weapon was basically forged by Hades of the Underworld, it can cut through pretty much anything. And it can, it can even cut through hard light constructs, meaning that she can't, she basically just cannot be taken down by these forces of, uh, of, of the Green Lantern Corps. And so ultimately we end up learning that with the child of Superwoman, when she basically brings this kid to bear and then starts using him as the weapon that she intended to, that he can basically shout the word Shazam. Now, technically it's Mazaz, right? So just the reversal of Shazam, which makes sense because Earth 3 is the reversal of the main DC universe. Uh, and basically he has the power of Shazam, but the but it's, it's a little bit different in the sense that unlike Shazam, where he basically goes through and like gains powers from other people, the baby can take powers from other people. And so the intention of Superwoman is to basically use her baby to siphon off the power of pretty much anybody else, including Shazam from the main DC universe and gain his powers in turn. And so when that happens, Steve Trevor basically launches an attack to take out Wonder Woman at the direction of Grail, despite his desire not to do so. And when that takes place, you have Grail who kills Superwoman and then uses the baby and shouts Mazaz. And then in turn, that basically splits the Flash and it splits uh, the, the Black Racer into, into two separate beings. When the Flash runs directly in front of the blast that was meant to kill 
kill Wonder Woman. Now, splitting the two in half basically sends the Flash out of the equation because now the Black Racer is directly after him, right? So Flash just kind of has to leave in order to keep himself from being killed. And that just sort of continually follows suit, right? That there's a little bit of a reprieve here that the superheroes get trying to figure out what to do. Now, for the most part, Jessica Cruz also ends up being attacked and it's believed that she's basically dead when she's cut down by uh, by the by the Black Racer. But one of the things that had kind of gone on here is that within the ring itself, and even with Jessica Cruz, when Cyborg had downloaded or at least tried to make contact with the ring and downloaded his essence into it, and both Thum had taken over taken over Jessica Cruz, that her consciousness sort of existed as a background character, right, within the ring itself. And kind of having this conversation with Cyborg and watching everything go on and watching the various heroes seemingly lose in almost every conceivable way, that she ultimately overcame her fear when she stepped out. And so jumping in front of and facing off against the Black Racer the way that she did basically allowed her to overcome her fear of death. And if you're not afraid of dying, you're not afraid of anything, right? So basically she'd overcome her fear in her entirety, which was a, a pretty significant moment because that's how she became a full on Green Lantern, right? Which of course we know from our coverage of the Green Lantern stories uh, post Dark Side War. And so following that, it really kind of comes down to Grail who exercises the final moment of her plan, right? The final intention of her plan. And what she ended up doing was basically following this prophecy that said that the first person who stepped foot on Themyscira was considered quote unquote, the chosen one. And so bonding the anti-life equation to Steve Trevor was really nothing more than one, allowing her to destroy Mobius, but two, to basically just kind of keep it safe, right? Just sort of keep it guarded because she knew that none of the members of the Justice League would actively kill Steve Trevor. And so when that happens, she basically ends up taking the baby of Wonder Woman, has it shout Shazam, and then takes the anti-life equation directly out of Steve Trevor in the process. And so the baby basically absorbs the anti-life equation and is totally reborn as Darkseid. And so when Darkseid re-emerges here, that it's not really Darkseid as we know, it's Darkseid bent to the will of Grail. Because of the fact that he's kind of dominated by the anti-life equation, he does whatever she tells him to. And that's exactly what happens. Like she's just like, kill them all, right? So basically it's now Darkseid and Grail facing off against the, uh, facing off against the Justice League. And so because of the fact that there's so little chance for success here, Hal Jordan does the only thing he can do here, right? With Batman basically being kind of knocked off the Mobius chair, being removed from the Mobius chair, because of the fact that Batman's not directly willing to remove himself from the Mobius chair, what he needs is the willpower to do so. And so Hal Jordan takes his Green Lantern ring and basically attaches it to Batman's finger and says, the universe needs you more than me, right? I'm just a guy who flies and fights. Like I'm pretty capable and I've got a lot of willpower, but we need your mind. We need your willpower. We need your ability to function as a cohesive member of the team, not some crazy guy sitting on a chair telling us that we're screwed. And so because of that, when that happens, Batman full on becomes a Green Lantern, but it's not something that really, that, that doesn't really become a mainstay here. And it makes sense because this doesn't really happen until the end of the story. If it had happened at the beginning, I would say Batman would definitely have a more prominent role. But Batman being a Green Lantern here is just kind of designed to help him one, remove himself from the chair, and then two, to basically find a way to help the superheroes win. Now, Owlman, of course, ends up basically saying, okay, fine, like everything's done, time for plan B. Bonds himself to the chair, uh, basically takes the, the essence of grid from Earth-3, downloads it from Cyborg, and then leaves. And they basically end up putting it inside of a, uh, of, of a bot that was created by Lex Luthor. And so from there, Cyborg basically goes back to his normal self. And so Owlman basically bails out, right? He immediately takes off. And I imagine most of you guys know exactly what happens to him. The other part of this is that because the ritual was cast by, by Grail, the only way for the ritual to be undone is for Grail to undo it herself, which is something that she's not remotely interested in doing or so it would seem. What ends up happening here instead is that the, the, the lasso of truth by Wonder Woman is basically wrapped around Grail and basically compels her to tell the truth, right? Compels her to be honest. And when she does, there's this really, really human moment that happens here where she legitimately believes that she cannot be good, right? She cannot be a good human being, that she has to effectively be a villain. And so when that happens, like her mother tells her like, you can do good, right? You can be an actual great person. And so she says, do the thing that you that you know you don't want to do, but you know you have to do. And she's like, kill me, right? Like Marina Black is just like, use your, use your power and kill me. Now, the reality of this is that when Grail does this, one, it does pierce Marina Black and kill her, but two, it also kills Darkseid. Now, the reason why this blast kills Darkseid is because it's not Darkseid in his most pure form, right? It's not Darkseid as we're traditionally used to seeing him. Instead, it's just kind of Darkseid, the guy who's kind of a resurrected baby, right? So again, coming into his own, containing the full totality of Darkseid's power had not really been achieved at that point. The other part of this is that because Jessica Cruz had in effect sacrificed her life in order to save the life of Barry Allen and basically overcome her fear of death and by extension, her fear of pretty much everything else, the Ring of Old Thum, of course, is ultimately destroyed, but she's bonded with a Green Lantern ring and is chosen to become
become a full-on member of the Green Lantern Corps. Now, this was kind of like the conclusion of the Jessica Cruz story arc, if there really is such a thing in DC Comics. Uh, Jeff Johns had paid special attention to her character when he introduced her in. The idea of her and Simon Baz was to introduce like new Green Lantern characters that DC could exclusively focus on. The problem was at the time that they were introduced, DC didn't have any intention or hadn't even conceived a dark of uh, uh, DC Rebirth. By the time this story came to an end, it's DC Rebirth comes next. And that's why you don't really see a whole lot of attention paid to Jessica Cruz and Simon Baz in relation to like everything else going on in the DC landscape as part of Rebirth. Instead, they were kind of shuffled off to their own story in the Green Lanterns comic book by Sam Humphreys, which was amazing. Don't get me wrong. It didn't, it did not suck. It was an amazing book. It was probably some of the best Green Lantern storytelling that I think I'd ever seen. Like between Robert Venditti's Green Lantern run and Sam Humphreys' Green Lantern run, it was crazy good. Like it was just ridiculously amazing, especially when you got the origin of Volthoom. If you guys are interested in that, you can check the Green Lantern playlist down in the description. And yes, we will do more Green Lantern. Don't worry. I'm not going to leave you guys hanging forever. But in essence, it's really just kind of picking up the pieces. The Black Racer is basically out of the picture now doing its thing, right? It's just kind of off doing Black Racer stuff, whatever the Black Racer does. Uh, and the Justice League just kind of picking up the pieces from this, this massive conflict. There is a bit of an epilogue in the sense that with Grail having killed her mom, but because the, the essence of Darkseid was kind of dispersed, that it still exists in this sort of child form. And so Darkseid will emerge at some future point in time. But the big takeaway from this, there's, there's two major things that come out of this. The first is that Lex Luthor basically sits on the throne of Apocalypse as quote unquote, the new dark side. This matters because when you go into action comics and Superman Rebirth, for those of you guys who are reading the point where, you know, DC Rebirth Superman never trusted Lex Luthor because he always believed he would become dark side. That's where this comes from. That's, that's where that particular thing comes from is this particular moment in the comic right here. The other thing, the other big thing that comes out of this is the epilogue, which directly set the stage for DC Rebirth in the sense that on the moon, you've got Owlman, who's basically there alongside Metron, the two of them kind of having a conversation of sorts. And what is up going on here is that while the two of them are talking, that suddenly you end up having this realization from uh, from Owlman that like he basically says he's here. And while we don't really get an explanation or didn't at the time, suddenly you basically end up seeing Owlman destroyed in the same way that you saw Dr. Manhattan kill Rorschach at the end of Watchmen, right? So that's what people were referencing when they were talking about these little clues and things like that, that Dr. Manhattan's in the DC universe now. Uh, and of course, this all directly leads into DC Universe Rebirth number one, right? The one-shot comic that sort of set everything off. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you guys are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoy this video, make sure you drop a like, and I will catch you all later. Peace.